This conference will now be recorded. So Saudi board will be OSCE and uh, we are working on the OSCE for October 2020. So the things have not changed much. We have to follow the Ovigani Saudi board program guidelines, which the published um, to guide you that how it should be prepared. So as you know that OB and Gyne, this is a combined medical and surgical specialty. And uh, here we are dealing with the health issues related to the female genital care and reproductive system in one line. And this specialty is divided into OB and gynae. And the fact that makes OB a unique specialty is because it deals with two patients in one individual, the pregnant woman and her unborn child. Therefore, the caregiver has to make sure that both are well cared for. One reason of failing OSCE is that we people who keep talking about the mother, we have to talk about the baby also. Gynecology, on the other hand, deals with the problems of non-pregnant females from the onset of puberty until afterwards throughout menopause and even in the post-menopausal problems. So the doctor who has to practice, who are taking up career in OB gynae like you, so you have to know about all of these things, both OV and gynae. So you should have extended medical care. You are going to provide to the baby and, and the mother, and then you have to ensure that both are adequately supported for a favorable outcome. On the, uh, like one of the major branches is maternal fetal medicine, which deals with high risk pregnancies, which can be either due to fetal anomalies or the pregnant mother suffering from the ailments like heart failure, cancer, chronic lung disease, etc. Can be anything for that matter. Another branch is adolescence, adolescent gynecology. This one is totally ignored by the doctors. I don't know why, because adolescent girls, like those who are between the ages of 14 to 16, 14 to 18, they are also your patient. If they are younger than 13, like they are 12, they will go to the peds. But once they turn 13 or plus, then they are going to be your patients. So this is very important area. You should know about their important issues, and uh, you should know that uh, you can consider them pediatric patients, but still, you know, they can have problems. And then you have to see that what are the problems and can we help them? I will give you one example for that, like the girl who is coming to you with primary amenorrhea. So if there are congenital abnormalities, you should be knowing about that. You should be able to care for them. Then ob gyne becomes very challenging because it has got many, many subspecialties in just one subject. And it is very hard to differentiate between the specialty and the subspecialty. Like uh, IVF pregnancies, reproductive endocrinology, subfertility and urogynecology, then oncology. These three are highly specialized branches and we get students who are here for the fellowship programs. They also have to have, you know, this exam, they have to do the research work. So that's why I'm, I'm familiar with many of them and because they are also attending courses with us. So those things they have to read in detail, too much detail and the current literature. But luckily for you people, you can still take help from the guidelines you can take help from the, the search papers, just a few of them from the journals. So basically your task here is to identify the problems and then solve them, okay? So in the urogynic, in the subfertility, in the oncology, you should just know the basics. Like you should know how you're going to triage your patients, okay? Then you should have very good concept on the multidisciplinary team who should be in the team who should not be on the team okay and then um, many other things you are dealing with both medicine and the surgery in one subject that's why it becomes very challenging so this information i have taken from the saudi board of specialties Ubi why it is there because it's my experience i have been teaching for like now two decades it's my experience that if you know exactly what the board is expecting from you, you are going to do that thing very nicely. You will not waste your time. You will be very specific. Your preparation will be good. And inshallah, you will pass in the first two also. On the other hand, if you will, 
on the other hand if you will just go uh, blindly then you know it is going to take a lot of time problem okay? so that's why you should know so what is the purpose the purpose is that you should you have to demonstrate that you can practice as a specialist and you can work as an ob consultant so think at the level of specialist and more better if you will think at the level of consultant because once you get the certificate you are going to work independently so they want to make sure that everyone should come and they should you should be a safe person patient safety is at number one you should have good knowledge good skill and you should know what you are doing why you are doing and how you are achieving that we'll talk about that then the OSCE exam ensures that you have necessary clinical competences which are relevant to the discipline of ob gyne and it means you should be good in history taking physical examination documentation you should have the procedural skills excellent communication skills you should know about the ethics bioethics diagnosis management investigations and also data interpretation this one in just three lines they have covered everything you have to know the subject you should be very good in communication you should ensure that your patient is understanding you and then you should invite questions also i will tell you how you can do all of these things in one go okay that is the point you know uh, one of you is saying that not hearing me so in that case please check the computer uh, maybe your speaker is switched off just go to the control panel and uh, check it out please because you know others are hearing me right is anyone able to hear me hello doctors Are you hearing me? This conference will now be recorded. Okay, you know, history taking is very basic to the OSCE. You have to appear confident. You have to follow a good format. Um, I will today we will discuss that how we can take history in the obstetrics and how we can take history in the gynae because that is the basic thing. Then most of the time you don't have to perform physical examination, especially the intimate examination that is not allowed. Okay, so it is they will give you the information. They will mention that in the screen, so you will have to find out that what exactly is going on in this patient, what are the findings. So that is important for you. So then what else you can do? And then regarding the skills, you should be good. You should be very good in the documentation. What is important in the documentation? WHO surgical safety checklist, patient safety checklist. We will dis keep discussing many things as we will go through the sessions. Always confirm name of the patient sometimes just to check you that you are a good person you are caring properly they will give you name of one patient and you will find that another patient is sitting there okay so in that case you will have you need to confirm and you will tell them that this file doesn't belong to this patient this is a different patient so then they will give you marks for that and then they will give you the correct paper also always check the name of the patient healthcare number age, her total history, what grabbed up para abortion, whatever is her history, mention that one, why she's there, confirm the purpose. After confirmation, then you should uh, start the process, the, the whole station. And before talking to any patient, you have to introduce yourself. I will tell you that how you can start a station and how you should stop a station. As closing, starting and closing, both are equally important. Documentation is very important. Here they can give, they can use a variety of stations. They can just give you discharge summary of some patient. Now you know that everything is electronic. 
but still for the sake of exam they can take uh, such things out of the pool they have a central bank in the Saudi council where they are storing everything for the sake of examination and you know about that there is question pool there is OSCE pool so something will be missing name of patient is not there or the name of the surgeon is not there what procedure has been done the findings are not there okay so we'll talk about them that what is good documentation but and what is poor documentation then the procedural skills they can ask you to perform something on the dummy and all or they can ask you like to deliver the second twin they can ask you to deliver a breech baby they can ask you to apply vacuum or apply this obstetric forceps anything can be there then sometimes they will simply ask you to describe a surgical procedure like um, all of these will be in the structured discussion they will just put some instruments and then they will ask give you the history of a patient it is never like this that they will tell you okay doctor so and so let's say i'm dr aisha i'm sitting for the exam okay dr aisha tell me about the steps of total abdominal hysterectomy nobody is going to be that direct they will give you a patient who will have a huge fibroid and she is having abnormal uterine bleeding which is so bad that it is affecting her quality of life so then they will tell you that she has been scheduled for some procedure what is the ideal procedure okay that is the point that is the point okay so that's how you will proceed then the communication skills these are you should have excellent communication skills because you are not just a medical doctor you have to be a good communicator also why because your patient is already under a lot of stress if you don't listen to them properly you don't talk to them properly or like you with non-verbal cues it will go against your experience okay that is the point that is the point so you should be very good so then what else then ethics somebody will come to you like there is a patient so what is happening then uh, you know one of you is still having some problem and i will tell you that please log out i will writing for and logging again that is the point okay um like in cases of pid the woman is having some infection somebody can approach you and ask you that tell me what is the problem with my wife what is happening or in cases of infertility a male person can come to you and he will tell you that uh, I have this problem. I don't have these. I did uh, a test on myself, got it done, and I don't have any sperms. And don't tell this thing to my wife and continue giving her treatment. Then you know that it won't be ethical. So you will not break her, his confidentiality, but you will encourage him that he should talk it out with his wife. And then they should make a plan because everything can be solved. Then somebody will be like this that you are doing a procedure and the daughter of a, an old person will come to you and she will say um, that you know you should uh, uh, tell me that what exactly has happened to her. In that case, you will not say anything. Why? Because you will not breach her confidentiality. The patient can give consent for herself. Nobody will give consent for her. So you should keep these general things in your mind diagnosis yes even if it is iufd in your profitable death you have to disclose the diagnosis in a good meal your questions your stations they should be on the management management is the center to the OSCE. okay in the investigations they can ask you to interpret the results of investigations and or they can ask you about the most suitable investigations and uh, then this data interpretation like you should know that what is the research showing and what complications are there, okay? So you have to that exactly is this one. 
so we'll talk about that also they can ask you to do an audit they can ask you to read an audit report they can ask you to talk about the clinical risk management they will not tell you they tell us about clinical governance but clinical governance is tested on each station they will not tell you but tell, tell me about information gathering but information gathering is involved in almost each station how it is involved i will tell you talk to you then the question is that how they are going to test your competences so you are going to follow the same same curriculum i will show you now which is recommended for the part two examination so you already know about the number of attempts and the stuff so i will not tell you about it. can anyone tell me about the format of the exam what is your understanding This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so regarding the exam format, you should know that the final clinical examination, it will consist of 10 graded stations and each with 15 minute in encounters. In the 10 stations, they consist of five OSCE stations, which means objective structured clinical exam. With one examiner each, and five of the stations, they will have two examiners each. Then all stations, they shall be designed to assess integrated clinical encounters. So some stations, they are designed with uh, key set questions and ideal answers. So each OSCE station, it is assessed with a predetermined performance checklist, a scoring rubric for the post and counter questions is also set in advance. So never think that, that, uh, that the time was not enough because these questions, they are already experienced and tested by someone. Okay, so actually they run a mock exam before you with the volunteers and they will check that everything is fine and candidates, they should be able to answer all questions in that time. Okay, that is the point. So don't, don't think that time will not be enough. There will be plenty of time. Rather, you will think that you have nothing to talk about. So the only solution is practice and that to practice with the right material and in the right way. So then any clinical encounter, which is scored below the pass mark in the OSCE station, it will be independently reviewed. It is not in the first instance. Second time, it will be seen by another examiner after review of the video recording. Please mute yourself and the average of the both examiner scores, it will be the final candidate score on that particular station. And final results are still approved by a specialty examination committee. So then what type of clinical tasks are included in the exam? So the pass mark for this examination, it will be a summation or addition of its components. These components will include the following. Like they can show you different slides. They can take OSCE, like objectively structured clinical examination stations. They can take oral examination and bedside examination. Please mute yourself. We are hearing voice from someone. Please do that because others are disturbed. Okay, that is the point. Thank you very much. So different parts of the exam and different uh, challenges. So here you can see. Patient care is most important. This patient care, it can be immediate care or it can be delayed care. Here you should know that how you can prevent um, disease from occurring, how you can promote um, that they should live a healthy lifestyle, what precautions they can take. So you can say that this is the primary prevention, that how you can educate people that they should not get these problems, okay? 
So this means health promotion and prevention of illness. So you can get two stations, and they can always change the order of the stations, but this is one given by the Saudi Council. Then acute problems or emergencies. Four. So here, usually, if you will review the questions for the last five years, two stations will be on obstetric emergencies and two will be on gynae emergencies. Then chronic conditions. You know, certain conditions are going to run a chronic course. So you should know about them. Then psychological aspects, they are becoming more and more important. You have to think about them also. So total clinical patient care is asked, tested in six stations. Then patient safety and procedural skills, usually you will get one station where you know you have to see that you are dealing with the right patient. She's being dealt by the right person in the right place. You are doing the right way in the right environment. And then you are going to get the anticipated results, right results. So something would have gone wrong with the patient or patient is at risk of something or it may be a simple uh, station where you have to counsel the patient regarding the uh, anticipated complications of a procedure and how you can solve them. Then in yet another station, communication and interpersonal skill. Here you can get any sort of station, but um, like what? Like, you know, you can get something someone that um, someone who is having some issues like like what husband is angry patient is angry why because maybe you forgot one swap and nobody took that out and now she's coming back but uh, she's pouring first and she, she wants your attention okay then you can get someone like a UFP has occurred and the husband or the patient is very angry that I came to your clinic two days ago. Why it was not picked up? Why didn't you tell us anything at that time? And now suddenly you are telling us that the baby is dead. So basically it will be like some acute problem. It can be someone who is having like the hemorrhage. So in that case, you need to counsel her. It will be like the attendant, attendant of the patient. Okay? So you need to counsel them. Of course, in the obstetric or the gynae emergencies, you are not getting the patient. In gynae, you can still get someone like someone who is getting this. And she has like this ectopic pregnancy. In ops, you will always get something like this where the patient has preterm labor. Okay? So then you have to pay attention to the psychological behavior of the patient and then clinical management of the patient. Because patient will be shouting at you that why do you want to take my baby out? Baby is not even nine months, baby is going to die. So what, what I, why are you doing it? So you have to manage care of the mother, care of the patient, and then also care of the uh, baby also. Please mute yourself, please mute yourself, whoever is this one. I don't want to mute you all because I I want to encourage questions and later you have to answer my questions. So that's, that is that is okay? So anyone who is having this slide, please mute yourself. Okay, then you have to show professional behavior. Like maybe some complaint is against your colleague, or maybe you have seen someone uh, who is not doing something very well, then you need to check on them, and uh, you don't want to make an official complaint, okay? So initially you will talk to someone. Then there can be some teaching station, where you will have to talk to someone that you are, you are going to give a talk or you are going to tell something about the protocol of a hospital or clinic that what is happening here how it can be improved and stuff like that okay? so these are important things so you should keep them in mind so total stations you are going to get 10 this uh, composition can change but this is usually the recommended one okay? so they, you should prepare yourself according to that so now you should know that when you are dealing with ob OSCE, you have to talk about the patient. If she's pregnant, you have to talk about the baby of that person. And then you have to focus on the family of that person also. That's how you can help them. That is the point. So everything should be there. All at once, so that's why presence of mind is essential. So the process of enabling uh, like health promotion and illness prevention, it means the process of enabling people 
to increase control over their health and its determinants, thereby improve their health. Illness prevention it covers my yes, not only to prevent the occurrence of an illness such as risk factor reduction, but also arrest its problems and reduce the consequences once established. I will give you the example. Like uh, a patient is there, she is obese, has planned a pregnancy. So you will ask her that before starting her pregnancy, she should idealize her weight. Otherwise, she, should, uh, she can get GDM, she can get VTP, okay? things like that. Similarly, you can get a patient who is um, having this diabetes and she's coming to you for the pre-pregnancy counseling. So they will ask you that how you can do it. This is the point. Then it involves like uh, you need to tell them about the screening about the periodic health exams like the cervical screening program nowadays too much emphasis is placed on that vaccination on the for prevention of the cervical cancer then health maintenance patient education advocacy community and the population health then in the acute complications you should know about the you know the acute complications which are happening suddenly so you will have to see that how they are initially going to present and then how you will uh, how they will through the system. Urgent, emergent, life threatening conditions, new conditions, and then exacerbation of the underlying conditions. So you have to identify so you can understand the case. You have two tasks. First, you are going to identify the problem, and then you are going to identify the other issues. Okay, that is the point. Any questions, any issues so far? In the chronic conditions, you should know about illness of a long duration that includes, but it is not limited to the illness with slow progression. Then you have to pay too much attention to the psychological aspect of it. So it means that as a patient, which is because of the not having sickness, but you have to identify other risk factors. Like what are the um, challenges of the life, income, culture, impact of the patient, social, and the physical environment? You know, for uh, just one of you, uh, the continuous noise is coming, so then I will have to mute you. Then you won't be able to participate. You won't be able to answer the questions, okay? Please do that. Otherwise, I'm going to dismiss you. Hello. Mute yourself. Okay. So that remains patient care. Here you have to ask or assess what is the illness and the disease gathering interpretation, and then you are going to make up relevant information. Like you can do a particular history, like right? history, physical examination, investigations, and management. And uh, it is not uh, many other things you will have to do at the same time. Like maybe you have to make um, hello, a doctor. Care for doctor. Yes, here uh, it's not. There, there is some noise in here. I cannot hear you clearly. Yeah, that is the point. You know, I'm asking that. Yes, there is noise. Yeah, please, somebody whosoever is. Um, making this noise this noise from where it is coming because you know i i don't want to mute all of you because uh, you people have to take part you know then how you will contribute into the oski and uh, this sp who is this sahab That is the point. Okay. Is it better now? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, that's good. that's great. Because you know we all are working, so we need to use the time efficiently. That is the problem. So the patient care. Start with the history, take you will have to do the examination, or then as if, if the if they want you to do more on the management, then they would have given you the history. Okay. But uh, just don't start with the management. Again, you will confirm in one sentence. Like you can say, okay, you are Mrs. Asma. 
Okay. And uh, I have just gone through your notes and my impression is that you are having this problem. Is that true? She will say yes. Okay. And this, 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 and this has been done so far. She will say yes. So don't give her everything. You will give everything in chunks, in small pieces. Okay. This is your history. Okay. This is your problem. Okay. They have done that. Your doctor has done this, this thing so far. Is that correct? She will say yes. Okay. Then tell her that what is your overall impression and then you have to talk. You have to uh, tell in the non-medical language. Don't use any medical jargon okay? because otherwise you will lose marks for that. Then very important that you should tell her that what is the actual problem. Don't think that patient will feel bad because you know if she has a condition, if you will not tell her how you will manage her, you cannot tell. So tell her very clearly that you have this, 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 and this problem. And in my opinion, and in my after my assessment, I think we can deal with this problem in this way. Is it okay? She will say yes. Then give her full range of options. Like you go to the shop, you have got 10 colors of the lipsticks. You will not tell her that, okay, you can use this pink lipstick. That will be so inappropriate. You need to tell her that we have no different options. You are having this problem. My assessment is that uh, we, you have these options. We can do nothing and we can just wait. But the benefit is that we are not offering you any intervention. And the negative point is that if we don't do anything, then it is not going to stop here. It will process, it will proceed. Or if we don't stop it right now, then your health is going to suffer, something like that. Okay? Then we can offer you non-pharmaceutical intervention without any medicine, just lifestyle modification, like in cases of GDM. I will give you one example. We can do this lifestyle interventions in cases of infertility, where you have an obese person or even a thin person with PCOS, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay? What is the benefit? Then set the time limit that over this time frame, we hope to get this one, this benefit from this intervention. Okay, patient has declined or it is not acceptable, maybe whatever will be her response, you will record that. Tell her about the medical intervention, what you have to offer, what are her chances, what she should expect. Medicine, medical management, she has declined or maybe you, have, you are dealing with someone who received medical attention, medical treatment, but nothing happened. So now you have to proceed the level, okay? You have to increase the level, go for the surgical management. Now the patient is so much disappointed, he doesn't want the surgery. In the surgery also, don't tell her that I, I will do only this uh, hysterectomy laparoscopy for you because that is the best option. And throughout exam, you should never say, I will do this because the guideline says that. You are the one, you are the full authority. If you are dealing with, a, with another clinician, like in cases of structured uh, discussion, then you can give the reference. That you know the Canadian guideline says that, you know that ACOG says that, that's why I will do that. Even there, they don't want you to mention the guidelines or that, that because this exam is not vocational. Okay? This is dynamic exam. You are dealing with patients. You are showing their, your applied knowledge that you can use your knowledge to your patient's care. You have to show them everything. So it involves some drama, some acting also. Okay? You should not be shy about that. Consider that you are just sitting in your clinic or you are in your hospital and do anything you will do in your routine practice. Just be yourself. Don't have to follow anyone. You are unique. You are going to be confident. And I'm going to give you a lot of practice. And I want, my aim is that one month before your exam, everything will be coming out of your mouth in a perfect way. I want to hear completely that language which is understood by the examiner, okay? I will not say that just follow the buzzwords. They are nothing. Do anything that you will do in your clinical practice, okay? Let's go. So patient care is very important. Then patient safety and procedural skill. You know, I will give you an example of one uh, doctor. 
when she was taking OSCE, she came to us and uh, she did. I asked her that, what you do? how was the exam? She said everything went very well, but you know what happened? Um, on one station, everyone was angry with me because you know what I did? I said, yeah, what you did? And they asked me that how you will do the speculum examination in cases of PCOM. So I did, I just took the speculum and I inserted into the dummy and they all were so angry with me. I told them, this is only a dummy, so what is the problem? Then they said, no, you have compromised your patient's safety. So we are telling you right now that we will not pass you. Imagine, out of 10 stations, she did this on one station and she was out of exam. Then next year, she passed. So this one mistake cost her one year, you know. Even if the dummy is there, you will look towards the examiner. I will confirm identity of the patient. I will tell her what I'm planning to do and what is the benefit of doing this speculum examination. Then I will ensure you are a female or you are a male. You have to do that. You will say, I will ensure that a chaperone is there, someone, some attendant is there, can be the relative of the patient or can be some medical staff, but better if there is some medical staff, especially the nurse is there, okay? Then you will tell her that I have, I will introduce this one. Then I will open the lips of this cascope speculum. There will be, you will feel slight pressure, but it will be there for like two seconds or three seconds. And I, and this is essential for your management because I'm going to take the spa or I'm just going to see that the water is coming out from the mouth of the uterus. You have to explain that. Then after that, you will say that after taking her consent, you don't have to sign any paper. You are going to take a verbal consent. Then you will say, I will lubricate this speculum with a gel uh, and then with a sterile gel, and then I will introduce it, and then I will rotate it, and then I will see that, and after that, I will remove that, and I will put that in the tray, I will remove my gloves, and then I will talk to the patient again. That's all we need to do on that. We don't. Patient safety is one thing which in any healthcare system you will compromise and nobody is going to forgive you. Patient is everything, okay? At the same time, you don't, you don't have to compromise on your dignity also. You have to maintain self-respect, self-dignity. You have to compose yourself. Okay? One station you didn't do well, don't start crying. You can go home and cry. Just be silent. Decompose yourself, control yourself, and go to the next station with full force, happily. Don't smile during the exam. That is not acceptable, but you should be confident. Okay, let's see that what do they say. So patient safety emphasizes by reporting, analysis, and prevention of medical error that often leads to adverse healthcare events. Procedural skills, they encompass the areas of clinical care that require physical and practical skills of a clinician integrated with other clinical competences. In order to accomplish a specific and well characterized typical task or procedure, so you should be familiar with them. It involves everything, consents, complications, post op complications, how you should tell the patient once a mistake has occurred. Happening if a mistake occurs, like the bladder is damaged, ureter is cut, no problem, third degree perineal tear, it has happened. These things will always happen. They happened 100 years ago, they will happen 100 years after from this point onwards. Problem will come only if you fail to identify the problem. Then if you don't have the required skill, don't go and do anything. Just hold on, hold on and then call your senior. You should know, like in, uh, I will give one example of shoulder dystocia. You have, you cannot anticipate, you cannot prevent it. So it has happened. Then you should say, they will ask you that, okay, this is the case, what, will, what has happened, what will you do? You will say, I will say clearly, this is a case of shoulder dystocia. I will call for help before doing anything. This is an obstetric emergency. If you have one post of patient which is going into shock, then obviously she is having internal bleeding, or maybe she is developing this pulmonary embolism. Maybe she is there is a maternal collapse in OB. Opening sentence should be: This is an obstetric emergency. I will call for help. This is a gynecologic emergency. I will call for help. Then you will start. Okay? So don't forget to mention. They show you some. 
modified early warning scoring system, the chart, look at that, and then you'll see this is an emergency. I will call someone for him. Okay. okay. And then communication and interpersonal skill. Communication, you have to talk to the patient, their families, caregivers, other professions like your colleagues, other communities, and populations. Can be anyone. You have to see that what is their level of education. Do they understand you? And then if the patient is telling you something, don't just sit like a statue. Lean forward. Bend yourself. Go near the patient. Say, okay, what are you telling me? You have to do some acting, okay? And pay full attention to the patient. You will have standardized patients, okay? So where you see a standardized patient, don't look don't even look towards the examiner unless they ask you any question because once you have a standardized patient then the purpose is that you will pay all the attention to the patient and you will get all information from her okay or him in cases of male infertility you and don't be surprised if you get a male person sitting over there it happens doesn't it doesn't matter just listen to their complaint carefully and then answer that okay? then what they are telling you that is a verbal clue you should be able to pick up non-verbal clues also. Non-verbal clues, I will tell you that you will have some patient. Some patient has come to you. She's asking you, doctor, I'm 35 and I have I have come to you because I have severe pain in my tummy once I get my menses. So she's 35. She has been menstruating like for the last 20, 21 years. So why she's having pain now? But she will she will be twitching her fingers, she will be bending um, her head, she will be like banging her foot, moving her limbs, looking right, left. So this is a clue that she has something which is bothering her. So after asking, um, answering her question that, okay, you are having pain, it has started now. So what we can do is, this is, this is it. That's how we can proceed. Then you should ask her. Let's say her name is Noura. Okay, Mrs. Noura. Um, is there anything else you want to tell me? She will be silent. Then you should say, listen, I want to tell you something. Whatever you will tell me, it will be kept totally confidential. Don't worry at all. Especially in cases of domestic abuse, in cases of rape, in cases of sexual abuse. Then if the patient is having like a uh, She's a victim of domestic violence and she or she is having some chronic, some serious conditions. She has some cancerous etiology, something like that. She will not, maybe she will not say anything, okay? So you have to say whatever you will tell, it will stay here. This is totally confidential or you can see you can trust me and uh, then we can move forward. So then suddenly you, the patient will open up. She will tell you everything. Like I will give you one example. The patient came. And she said that, um, you know, I have some, uh, sometimes I have this funny tingling sensation in my hands and feet. I don't know what is happening. So I thought it would be better to get your opinion also. That's why I'm here like that. So you will, you know that everybody will get this funny sensation at some point in the day, in the, in a week, months. Hypocarasemia, you can have tetany or just your nerve was compressed. So you will ask her, okay, so this is the answer to this problem. Is there something else you would like to tell me? And then she will tell you, you know, my friend, her mother has died before because of cancer. And now her other, her elder sister, she has developed this breast cancer. So my friend, she's undergoing testing. So, you know, I was thinking that maybe I'm also going to get this cancer. So you think I should go for testing? So in that case, you will take the history and you will tell her that the patient, that maybe the patient, uh, like the, like her friend, maybe she was having some hereditary cancer. So her chance of getting the cancer is like 10% because of the hereditary cancer syndromes. Okay, So she's having it. So, but before I tell you something, can I ask you some questions? Always ask her some, say something like this. So can I ask you some questions? She will say yes. So uh, your brother, is he fine? Yeah. How are your sisters doing? They are fine. Tell me about your aunt. Did anyone has ever got any cancer? She will say no. Then you will always use paper pencil. They give you notepad, okay? You can use that. 
so that paper you are not allowed to take out of the examination hall but you can write some things if you, if you have paper just draw the picture for her you see Mira. your friend in, in her family maybe she's having something i cannot comment on that but maybe they have something which is running in their family but now when i look at your family history i can see that no one ever had any cancer okay so you don't have any risk of developing any hereditary cancer so don't worry about that but you know, if you have if you develop anything abnormal then you should seek medical attention so does it satisfy you okay like that similarly you can get someone who is having like she is coming to you with primary amenorrhea so she is concerned that all her friends they started to have menstruation at the age of 13 and she is already 16 and she is not getting it so you will have to tell everything in detail like that sometimes you will have to break the confidentiality when when the other person is at risk for example if the patient has come come to you she has hiv so at least her husband or the wife should know that she's having this problem okay? so you don't have to tell anyone like police has come you don't have to comment on that but those who are directly at the risk you need to tell them that is the point okay? so you should be able to understand the verbal non-verbal clues and the written communication like some interview is there there is some some error has occurred and now the patient has come to you and you have to break the bad news to you to her or she is there to complain you so before she proceeds she is, is coming there to have a word with you in that case you will tell, tell her everything and then you will proceed then you have sometimes you will have they will ask you to take an informed consent okay so they will tell you that how you are going to counsel her so counseling once you have already decided to do a surgical procedure now you are going to take a consent from her so how you will take that how you will break the risk how you will describe the risk you cannot say that the risk of having visceral injury is 10 percent you will have to say in a different way see fatma if we have 100 patients who has who have condition just like yours then out of those 100 patients 10 are going to have this problem so maybe you can also be one of those 10 persons but the good thing is that 90 patients out of 100 they do not have this problem so basically you have to tell them in a certain way so the consent guidelines are very helpful so we are going to do them also then the person professional behavior like you should have good attitude it doesn't mean that you should be like very lenient you are going to listen to everything if a patient patient misbehaves with you like there is a woman who is shouting and you i have been sitting in your clinic for the last three hours what happened to you why you have not seen me you will say um miss miss maram i'm very sorry that you had to waste uh, wait for three hours i'm sorry about it so please tell me what is happening now you don't have to say that for god in the name of god in the name of allah please forgive me please don't complain no, nothing like that things do happen we know that in the op kind there can be emergency many a times you must have seen that your consultant is in a, sitting in the opd and then suddenly something went wrong in the or and he had to leave and go there so the clinic is just held there for some time things are sometimes beyond your control so you have to show the professional behavior you should have good knowledge if somebody thinks that without reading one can pass the oski you are 100 percent wrong you have to read every single thing that you have done for your written exam but in a much summarized view just the summaries of the ACOG guidelines how they do how they proceed how they counsel and the consent guidelines you should be familiar with the law then if the patient is misbehaving with you when she is telling you that i'm going to complain and you should not say that leave me tell her about the procedure that what she can do and who is responsible for taking these complaints and let her go with it this is going to be fun then you should know that how the system works in your hospital who is responsible for a certain thing if something has gone wrong like something dangerous has occurred like there is a whole list of incidents serious clinical incidents which should be reported 
and uh, you should not forget such things. Like if term IUFT has occurred, you need to write an incident report form. And then you should know that whenever you are writing an adverse event report, you are not complaining against anyone. You are just doing the legal thing. The purpose of writing a serious incident clinical report is that we should improve the working of that case. Okay, it is not against anyone. This is job of the concerned persons to see that your complaint is correct. And if there was some negligence, something, then first time nobody is going to do anything. They will not ask you to do anything. Just notify that. Many are many figures are there. As we will proceed, we will talk about them. PPH is one of them. Retained swab is one of them. Poor fetal score is one of them. Unplanned blood transfusion. Then, uh, you know, this shoulder dystocian, still bad. Then, uh, you know, antipartum hemorrhage. You don't have to report as such because you are going to manage but PPH. Then, unplanned blood transfusion. Then, uh, many other things can be there. So, card prolapse can be there. Your sport breach presentation, very first stuff. With complications, you should write a report. But if the breach delivery was completed successfully, you don't have to do anything. So these are the things. Okay. Then you have to observe ethics. Then, how, what is the social behavior? What are the social norms? You should be familiar with them. What are the legal duties? Like I will tell you in cases of infections, like MRSA has occurred. So you need to inform the infection control department. Wound infection has occurred. Yes, you should tell the, the infection control team. We need that five, you know, five to six percent of the patients. They are going to develop the wound infections, but you should tell them. Similarly, if some viscera has been injured during surgery, you need to write a clinical incident report form. All of these things should be mentioned. So then if even if equipment was not good, it was not working, which resulted in some problem, like you want to do to do an instrumental delivery, but your vacuum pump, it was not working, it was not maintained, then you have the right to write down an incident report, okay? Because uh, the vacuum was not working, so you had to do a second degree cesarean section in the patient. So you took that. So all of these, they demand that you have to write the serious incident report. And this is your legal duty. IUFD has occurred, then whatever is the cause, you are not concerned with that. Or mother has died, unfortunately, then you have to write a report. This is this is by the law. By the law of the Soviet Ministry of Health, you are required to report all incidents to the central team. So you will write down, and you will give to your nursing office, or you will give to the manager on whatever is the system in your hospital. And then you have to deal with everyone with respect. You have to maintain integrity, accountability, and then you have to know that what is self-awareness, reflection, and then you should know that you should be in the habit of reading. If a junior asks you to teach them some skill, you should never say that, no, I will not teach you. If you are not in my group, this is not acceptable. Okay? You are going to teach them. Then you should remember that uh, learning is not like one one time event, like you have passed and this is enough. No, you have to update your knowledge all the time. Then the most important part is that how do they score your performance? Okay. So actually, when uh, we cannot say that in each exam, what will be the pass score? And the pass fail cutoff for each oscillation is determined by exam committee prior to conducting the exam. And they will use a, a minimum performance level scoring system. So each station, it shall be assigned a minimum pass performance level and based on the expected performance of minimally competent, competent candidate. The specialty exam committee, it will approve the minimum performance level. At least one examiner it marks each OSCE station. Actually, if there are two examiners, two have to mark and they are going to mark independently. And if I will show you one grid that how do they assess you, so each examiner will have like three or four pages. So they will go over them, they will just take that what is your performance. And then in the end, they will take the full score. That's why you know it takes some time to release your score. But trust me that 
when you will look at these lists, these are very lengthy. Okay. I will tell you about the scoring system also, but uh, assessment, they are going to see each and everything you say, each and everything you do. So two examiners, they have to do independent assessment. Then to pass the examination, the examination, uh, you have to get full marks. Where, like, um, you know, 70% of the total stations with 60% on each component. It can be in the Bible or it can be in the objectively structured exam or it can be in the Bible. So regarding the syllabus, here is a long list, that, but you can say that you have to do all the topics that you did for the written exam and then for the OSCE exam. So you will do the same both in the OB, both in the government. Okay. Almost everything is there. Only the basic sciences are not there. Like even you can see here that the maternal mortality, they, will, they can ask you the definitions. How you can reduce maternal mortality? What is perinatal mortality and morbidity? Then they can show you some piece of literature, like this will be audit of some hospital, and some important information will be missing. So unless you know that how do we carry out an audit, you cannot tell them that what is an audit and is there any mistake in this audit or it, and there is no mistake. So, but it is not hard, you can do that. The only problem is that we are not practicing such things, so that's why we have this problem. Then surgical technical capabilities, like they can ask you to demonstrate a procedure, demonstrate the steps, how you are going to hold a certain instrument, especially laparoscopic instruments. Okay? These are the things. Sometimes they will just bring a model. Here they will ask you to tie a surgical knot. So you should know about that. Okay? Sometimes they will bring dummy and the doll, and they will tell you that how you are going to deliver a breech baby. Sometimes they will ask you that mostly they like to ask that the first baby in a twin pregnancy has delivered. How will you deliver the second baby? So unless you know the steps, you cannot do anything. These are most important things, okay? So then this list goes on. Everything is including external cephalic version. How you are going to do that? What are the indications? What are the contraindications? Okay. So what information should be given in the start? So patient information leaflets, they are also very helpful. Okay, like that. Then regarding the diagnostic skills, I want you to draw your attention. They can ask you, what is karyotherapy? How do we do this histography or hysteroscopy? How do we do this procedure? Then what are the benefits? When, in which stage of the cycle you will take the sample of the um, endometrium? Because the woman has abnormally trying to be in okay? Then there can be something very simple, like how you will take the urine sample from a patient. So it is not like this that you will tell her that just you will take, catheterize her and take it. No, you have to explain the procedure to the patient. Even if you are giving her a bottle for urinalysis, you will tell her that she will wash herself. And once she is passing urine, once she has reached, reached the mid, then she is going to give us that sample. And then after that, she can she should completely evacuate her bladder and she should give that sample. She should keep that on the sink and then we will collect that. Similarly, if you are going to take the catheter, the sample, you should take consent, then you should clean the vulva, and then you should take the urine sample. Okay. So all of these things, what is happening? Why it is happening? So what should be done about it? Which, can, which are the possible outcomes? And then how you are going to achieve them? Or we call them WH questions, okay? All of these things. And then, you know, you can see everything is there. What is pelvic organ prolapse? What is urogynecology? Prolapses and this stuff, this is also covered in, under the heading of urogynecology. So many things will be there. So this is the list here. I will put that for your information on the web page, and then you can see that in your free time also. I'm sure that you know about them, but still, if you want to know that, you can go there. Similarly, the patient education, what you will tell them, how you will tell them how they are going to achieve it. The whole list. So um, hopefully we should do all the stations which have been tested in the last five years, and then you know the new things they will also come in. Okay. So like here, they gave in the this is the example given by the Seoul Council. 
like uh, let's say that you have a 47 year old woman and who is complaining of constipation and gradual enlargement of the abdomen with an irregular cystic mass filling the pelvis. The resident should be able to state the differential diagnosis here, describe the pathophysiology of each possible lesion and outline a program for establishing an accurate diagnosis. So this is the terminal objective, like the ovary is there, the patient has come to you, so just see that he is 47. So the chance of having a cancer in her is one in 1,000 because she's less than 50, but even one in one, uh, one in 1,000, there is a chance. You cannot say that she will never get a cancer. And this is irregular cystic mass. So you should think about the problems like that. What is the possibility, how you should proceed? So then you're going to answer all of your questions. Like you should, uh, you should see that how you will take the history, what are her symptoms, how all of them they started then what has been done so far how it is affecting her life always see what is the effect on the quality of life uh, quality of life issues are now gaining more and more importance rather if you will look at the exam 60 percent exam is traditional like they will ask you about the guidelines information from the guidelines in the ob and gynae and like 40 percent of the exam it will be on your behavior, your attitude, because they call it non-technical skill. How you deal with patient, how you communicate, how do you answer the questions of the examiner, how confident you are, are you listening to their questions, are you simply, are you not interested in the exam, or are you already depressed and you are going to think, you know, all of these things they matter. So we will talk about the communication skills also in a short time. So if this is a patient section, you have to tell her that what tests should be done and why they should be done. Then what can be the problems in the early diagnosis? Then you could plan her further, uh, you know, this arrangement that how you will organize that. If it is an a viva, then, you know, they will ask you, okay, there is a patient, what are the possibilities? You will give your differential diagnosis then how you can reach a diagram a definite diagnosis so of course you need to do the tumor markers you need to do the ultrasound and after that you know when you will see the right things they will give you another sheet okay these are the findings of the examination what should i do now so you will explain to them that what should be done now these investigations you say that we should do x-ray then automatically your next slide should be because x-ray will give us this information if you will say CT, then immediately you should say in cases of ovarian cancer for life of this matter, it will tell us that what is the extent of the disease. If you are doing MRI, then you should say it will give a, we will do MRI because MRI will give me full idea that what is the extent of disease. And then the second benefit is that it will tell me that how I can plan my surgery because it will tell you about the planes where you can give incision. So you are not going to do anything blindly. You are taking the help of MRI. But you should have good knowledge. Like I will give you one example. You have a case of placenta fever. Okay? And the examiner is asking you, do you think you should go for MRI? So then you should say that MRI is good. It is helpful in confirming the diagnosis, but I will go for the transvaginal ultrasound. She will say, are you not scared that she will have a vaginal bleeding? You should say, no, there is no evidence that she will have vaginal bleeding if I will introduce the, uh, this transvaginal uh, probe. Of course, I will take permission from the patient and will explain to her that what are her chances, then I will carry out this examination. And they, then they can ask you, since now another clinician is talking to you, they will ask you, that why, you, why are you doing this TBS? Why don't you go straight away for the MRI? You will say that in expert hands, sensitivity and specificity of both exams is the same, while in case and this transvaginal ultrasound, this is readily available. I don't have to schedule an appointment. So I will do that. Then they will tell you, okay, this patient went for the MRI. What do you think? Why they did MRI? They did MRI to see what is the extent of the placenta. Has the placenta involved the vascular bed in the abdomen? As you know, sometimes the placenta previa per it can go and it can uh, develop around the inferior vena cava, around the aorta. So 
things have can go this way also. Then sometimes the placenta it will go into the bladder. So this information is better seen on the uh, MRI. Though same finding, same sensitivity specificity. If we will do the ultrasound, because now very advanced machines are available, so uh, ultrasound is more cost effective. Um, you know, whenever you will suggest any intervention you will have to qualify that what is the benefit of that intervention and you are going you, you can say that this investigation is more cost effective why it is cost effective because it's used less resources it is not like this that you are going to do 4d ultrasound on all patients you should know that which patient needs ultrasound and which patient should never go for ultrasound because we can manage without that i will give you one example like in cases of placenta pedia accreta if you don't have to do ultrasound every now and then i will agree with you guys that between 28 weeks to 36 weeks you need to run the growth scans on such pregnancies because there is evidence that in placenta pedia the babies can be iugr but you don't have to do the ultrasound every two weeks why because it is not going to influence your further management so the guidelines say that now you can diagnose placenta pedia at 16 weeks of pregnancy because the same uh, benefit as you will diagnose at 20 weeks and the same benefit, nothing different. If the patient is stable, then you don't have, she doesn't have any bleeding episode, then you don't have to run any ultrasound ever again before 32 weeks of pregnancy. In cases of where the placenta was major, then repeat ultrasound at 32 weeks. At 32 weeks, either either you will confirm that there is placenta pedia, or you will exclude this possibility that there is placenta pedia. Secondly, if if you have a patient with marginal placenta pedia, now you know that we don't categorize that as type one, type two, type three. Okay? Marginal placenta pedia or minor placenta pedia. So in the end, she doesn't have any bleeding episode. You will not repeat anything. You will wait till 36 weeks of pregnancy. And then you will confirm that she is having any problem or she is not having any problem. And then, the important part of the management, you should always say that I will document everything in her notes. Because if you don't document everything, then it means that nothing will be done. Okay? That nothing has been done. That is the point. Any questions so far? Okay, so when you are offering the um, you know chemotherapeutic agents, you should know that we, what are which medicines are anti-metabolites, which are chelating agents, which are antibiotics, and uh, then that who are mitotic inhibitors, and uh, then uh, can we give steroid hormones? What are specific? specific metabolic inhibitors you know all of these things you should be mentioning that so that is a wonderful okay you should have some idea okay. so this, these are just examples okay that as we will go through the course we will be doing everything but you you can see that all of these examples are given by the these are for the OSCE given by the Saudi Council I have taken from there too you are applying corposcopy, laser, cryo, you should know that for, why you are doing a certain investigation. So that's how you are going to proceed. So there you are going to cover everything. In the research, if they show you a document, then you should know that you know the basics of critical appraiser of our literature. This is very simple. Any type of document, I will give you a format, you will follow that and they can bring any document from any healthcare system and you should be able to comment on that. So the learning objective is that you should be able to know the study design. They will show you something, you should see that this is a controlled trial or uncontrolled trial, randomized, non-randomized, retrospective, prospective. This is a cohort or what? What is the process of randomization? Then if you should demonstrate ability to interpret odds ratio and confidence intervals. Then you should be able to describe the rationale for and the basic techniques which are used in developing meta-analysis, meta-analysis. Then the surgical procedures. You should know that what are the common complications, why it is necessary to make 
pre-operative preparations. And before going for any surgery, you should understand, you have to show them that you understand everything. You have to provide emotional care for how long she will be away from home, how many days she should stay in the hospital, what are the principles of enhanced recovery program, how you can involve the principles of enhanced recovery program in her management like that. When she will come, who will see her, who is responsible for her care, when this procedure will be done, for how long she is going to stay, how long the hospital procedure is going to take place, and then what are you going to give her before surgery? What is the procedure like? What she will be getting? Then where she will be kept, like he will be kept in the HDU or in the recovery for some time. Then what should be given to her? How you are going to manage her pain? How you are going to protect her from the infections? For how long you are going to keep the catheter? When it will be removed? When she can walk? When she can drink? When she can eat? What is the procedure of giving her analgesics? How you will address other complications? When she is going to be mobile? When are you going to remove the dressing? When are you going to remove the pain? When are you going to remove the catheter? When she is going home? And once she goes home, what she should expect in the home also? What is she going to do? Okay, what should be doing? Uh, she should be doing. Who is responsible for her overall care? When she is coming back for follow up, and what will you talk about in the follow up? When she can resume her normal activity, these include when she can go for driving, if she likes to exercise, when she can go and start her exercise, very important part of her life, when she can resume sexual activity. This is one of the parameters of being uh, of well being of your patient. So you are a professional, don't feel shy at that time and say that, no, I will not talk about this. No, you have to tell her when she can return to her normal activities, what sort of diet she should take, when she can start going back to her work, what should be her routine, and if she develops any complications like the color of the urine changes, if she's having discharge, the color changes or the smell changes, or if she has pain or she has any bleeding, or she has some strange feeling, or she has swollen legs, when she should return to the hospital, when she should go to the uh, primary care physician, PACC, okay? All of these things you have to tell them. If you have done a procedure, you have applied staples, then you need to tell her very specifically that uh, when she should come back, who is going to remove the stitches, how many sittings uh, should be there before you remove the stitches. You know that after 10, some people, they like to remove the staples after five days, but mostly you should remove the staples after seven days and half of the staples should be removed on day seven. Then next half should be removed on day 10. But for the sake of example, we will say on day five from the procedure, I will remove half of the staples, I think. Then you need to tell the patient that she can take bath properly. She can put soap everywhere. She doesn't have to apply soap directly on her incision. And by the way, if you will think, this is what you are doing in your routine. Whenever you are seeing your patients, you are always telling them, okay, these are the things. Then the reference or to the other places are very important. Especially, I will give you examples of the patients who have medical disorders of pregnancy. You should be very conversant, very much familiar with the things that who is responsible for her medical care. Who is responsible for her obstetric care? Okay, and what she should expect from these consultations. And uh, then, uh, how you are planning to arrange her care, how her care will change, and always give her a contact number and information, website, hospital number, where she should contact in cases of emergency. So don't leave her without information. So frankly speaking, you have to do everything that you will do in your hospital. Okay, so we'll keep discussing more and more topics. Don't worry about it. So regarding that, how they are marking you. So full instructions, they will be given for marking, for example, like uh, the one given below for a postgraduate OSCE. Okay? There were two examiners. Okay? That's when you have got two marks. This is satisfactory, so you are going to pass. 
the overall score is 1.5 out of 2. This is borderline quality. So they will see that in uh, what is your overall score, then they will pass you. They're not deciding you on the basis of, uh, they will not fail you on the basis of just one station. Okay? But the point is that at least seven out of 10 stations should be done very well. If you get like 50% marks, like one out of two, then this is considered unsatisfactory. And it can occur due to significant error or omission. Like you forgot to mention something, but more importantly, you did something which has harmed your patient. Okay? So be very careful what you say. And the only way to avoid is practice. In practice, in the right way, I will tell you that how you are going to practice with me and how you are going to practice in your own private time. And don't think that four months are very long. No, you will not even realize and your examination slip will be in your hand. So every single day you have to work very hard. There are no shortcuts in life. Okay. If somebody got like 0.5 marks, half mark out of two, so weak quality for the level required zero then they have multiple problems which can be due to significant error or omissions like the things you are missing okay so then you know detail yeah, in detail they are going to discuss and then this is your overall score then um you know the exam can be on the same day it can be on the different days as you know about it so each level shall be explained in detail with the description, descriptors to ensure that every candidate is assessed in the same way. And this is particularly important when more than one examiner examines the same patient, maybe at two or three different centers. In the case of Saudi Board Part 2 level, the required level is that of the specialist and consultant. So don't even think specialists who are the consultant responsible for everything, okay? But still, I will give you one tip still like you have not uh, fully become a specialist okay so if you have if they ask you actually it doesn't happen but if it happens patient asks you something which is like you don't you cannot recall that thing right now so what you should tell you tell her you should say that uh, you have asked me a good question really this is very good question i'm sorry right now i don't have the answer but please give me some time let me ask the consultant and I will get back to you. So they will get, they will cut little marks, okay? But if you will give her wrong information, they will cut, they will cut full marks, okay? So better if you don't know anything, then you will say, uh, Fatma, I think I need to discuss this point with my consultant, but I will talk and I will inform you as soon as possible. Sorry about it, but I want to give you correct information. So, and, and they will appreciate your honesty also. Don't worry about that. So unsatisfactory due to multiple things, and then we can go back like that. And they will give you the uh, instructions and training material when the, for the patients, which patients who are coming, and we call them standardized patients. Okay. So they will get, uh, you know, if you will go to the examination hall very early, you will see that in a hall, so many people will be sitting there with several sheets of papers in their hand. And what they are doing, they are trying to recall, they are trying to learn their lines because that's how they are going to talk to you. So don't be upset because they are just like you and they are not very much experienced and they are not actual patients. Most of the nursing staff or the technicians who will volunteer or who will come on the payment and sometimes in some places, they can call the actors also, but you are not going to see the actual patients. So they are also new they will be trying to remember their lines they will have their sheets and they will get directions like this if so if, if you during during exam the thing that patient was very hard on me she didn't ask me question in a dignified manner like this don't be upset because it was her direction that she has to be a bit rude with you like uh, someone who is very angry with me she will say that who gave you the lessons to work you know, why are you playing with the lives of others don't think that she's criticizing you because she doesn't even know that who you are. She has been told to behave in that certain way. So don't let anything you know, affect your performance. Okay, so this is OSCE is basically the game of nerves. I will tell you that I have seen the most brilliant persons, a brilliant, I mean, really brilliant persons whose scores in the written exams were very high. 
but during the exam they were under high pressure because they wanted to perform equally well on the OSCE and then they missed some important information so don't take that that much stress do your best now you want to take the stress this is the time you should be fully ready for the exam so if you ask me that what is the date of your exam for me this is 25th of september you can write down okay so don't think that in the last month you are going to become aristotle nobody can be, can have that much of transformation this is the time to work hard and learn everything okay so let's go over these things that what do they expect from you so whenever they are making the stations they will use ms words and uh, ms word they are going to use it they will make ms files and everything would have been written very clearly and uh, it is written in such a way that everyone should be able to read it okay so don't worry about that at all that is the point okay so what you can do is like they can ask you different things like history taking from a non-standard standardized patient for example a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus who wants to conceive or she's already uh, already pregnant and you know you should know about all different types of histories it is not like just one type of history that's why i'm going to give you i will give you inshallah uh, two general templates templates means that you, these things should be on your fingertips don't miss anything please so then if you will follow the, that method you will be able to take history from everyone then as we will practice with the modules i will give you the list of modules that which module we are going to discuss next week and i will tell you that what do you need to read for that module okay? that's how we can progress there are like 11 modules or maybe if we will bring out the non-technical skills the number will increase to 40. so you are going to work hard and then we will see that how we are proceeding okay if you are able to do very well on one station then immediately after like two three days i will ask you to prepare the next module and then we can practice with that but I want you people to take time and once you come to the class, you know, you should come when you are free, okay? Just tell everyone that don't disturb me. I have to answer the questions because this is your chance to practice and practice is not like uh, you're just talking to yourself. You are going to do the supervised practice because if you will say something which is not asked for or you will say something extra or your information is missing, then I will tell you that how you should do the a certain station like that. So you have to speak okay don't feel shy this is totally confidential speak up your mind your heart whatever you want to say even if you will uh, your opinion will be like okay, totally different from mine i'm not going to be angry with you we you have to give me the reason convince me you should try to convince me that why, uh, why the, your answer is correct and my answer is wrong. Okay? so i have no ego issues purpose is to prepare you in a good and in a happy manner you should be fully confident okay history taking you have taken history for the sle then and this was from some non-standardized patients then they can ask you to take history from a stimulated from a simulated patient like who has developed any problem any disorder okay then they may ask you to counsel a simulated patient for example the patient who has cancer or the patient who has come to you in the pre-operative period or someone who is a smoker don't be shocked to see because you are going to find many smokers they are all you know they are their habits so they are like and the diabetic who is coming to you so then how you are going to talk to them okay so pre-pregnancy counseling can be there or maybe you have just identified and uh, diagnosed someone who has had this iufd shock right but how you are going to counsel him Maybe you will get someone whose baby died, she delivered, and now she is at the same four week postpartum visit, and you have to counsel her about the future outcomes and stuff like that. This is like breaking bad news. Then they can ask you to explain the results of the lab or explain the results of both the medicines for this patient. Then they can ask you to do certain examinations like the um, best exam but usually you're not allowed to do the best examination but like they have also mentioned here also that you can have a simulated vision but usually the best examination you are not allowed to do any intimate examination thyroid exam you can do on simulated patient abdominal exam yes you can do in the abdominal exam but they can ask you they can ask you about the different grips you know the leopold grips 
then they can ask you to tell the lie of the patient. Then they can ask you that how you will take us in physiofrontal high. Okay? This all the information from the manual of the Saudi Council. Then they can ask you about the surgical procedures. Then they can ask you what are the principles of laparoscopy. Then they can ask you about similarly other clinical things. So we have a whole list. There, so I'll be sharing with you as we will practice. They can show you any charts, any lab results. Once I remember that we have shown what did the show was uh, three different ultrasound scans of the ovarian conditions like PCOS, hemorrhagic cyst, and other things like that. Okay. So if going back to the main purpose of the postgraduate OSCE, this is to check that what are the clinical competences and how what is the level of your achievement, how you can do in the practical life. You can have like integrated stations. What will you get in the integrated stations? These are the stations in which two of the more competencies they are tested, for example, history and examination. Can be history and data interpretation. Can be history and communication, like counseling, like in cases of uh, abnormality in the baby. Or you have to obtain information, you have to take a Informed, take an informed consent, you have to break the bad news, and so on. Then you know you should be ready. Sometimes they will bring and they will bring linking or the duplex stations. I will give you one example. Like in the first station, they will bring something like uh, for, her, for her, you have to carry out one operation. Okay, so you are taking consent from the, that patient and doing everything. In the next station, they can bring something who is like, um, she's not hearing you, okay? So you will have to counsel her. So you can, uh, so what happened? The first task, pre-op. Second task, she developed some post-op complication. So now your task is to explain to her that what has happened and now what should be done for her. Like you did in the first task, you took consent for the total abdominal hysterectomy. In the second task, you have a patient who has developed urethric injury. So you will, uh, she will be mad at you. That why I was not told this, this, this. You will have to tell her like that. Okay? So usually the time for the OSCE, this is like five to 15 minutes, like mostly for you, 15 minutes. Sometimes, you know, some stations, if they're ultra short, they can be five to seven minutes. Why they will be five to seven minutes? Because the next station maybe it will be like eight to fifteen minutes. This is in cases of duplex when you are getting the two stations. Similarly, you can get stations like in in one station you will get someone who is having a pre prom, and she's at 27, 28 weeks. Blood sugar level is coming high, but the patient is declining that she ever had this diabetes. So, but now she's wetting the urine is positive. So she's having like mild contraction, then you need to transfer her. In the second scenario, you will get someone who has a delivery at home and she's very angry with you. So both are linked tasks because you referred the patient, but this patient was referred without any medical care with a medical staff. So before reaching the second facility, she has delivered. So then you will have to counsel her. Then, you know, in some stations, some skills, they may need more than the prescribed time and two parallel stations, they are placed in the OSCE circuit and the candidates, they are fed first to one station and then they will go to the other station. Like, you know, in this one duplex, like one station is short, the other station is long, uh, is a longer one. So any anything, any combination can be there. Any questions? This conference will now be recorded. History taking is very important. Why this slide? Because you are going in a stepwise manner to reach your goal. History taking uh, involves, uh, they want you to take history both in obstetrics and also in gynecology. If we will talk about the general template that how we should take the history. You know, each history, first you will confirm the patient's data, name, there are six points. I will just talk about them in a while. After filling in the patient's initial data and everything, then you will have to ask about the presenting complaints. Then presenting complaints, you're not writing simply, we will talk about them, that how you should write them. Okay? In the time manner, which complaint occurred first, then what happened, and then what happened. 
then you will take a history of presenting illness then her past history past history is a very huge subject what is her medical history her surgical history her previous obstetric history previous gynae history never forget this history of allergies this is very important is she having any known drug allergies and then don't say yes or no if she says that she is allergic to something you should say okay tell me what happens if you take this drug she will tell you uh, you know doctor when i took this medicine first i had mild itching oh my god i have a, it was so irritating and like this and that that is one thing so she is having a mild allergy you ask another patient and she will tell you oh my god that was the worst experience of my life you know when i took that medicine what happened i was unable to breathe my husband rushed me to the hospital there they had to give me oxygen then you know they took me to the icu so you should automatically know that it was anaphylaxis so you should say oh very bad i'm sorry that it happened to you okay i will you know nura i'm going to write in your file in red ink or i'm going to enter in your record so that nobody will give you by even by mistake okay like that because you are allergic and it can be serious okay, that is the point then you have to ask about the social history and the sexual history occupational history what she does and then you have to assess her mental health at each visit it is becoming more and more important now you know if you will follow the maternal mortality guidelines the deaths due to suicide they are on a rise so you will ask her all patients two screening questions how has been your mood in the last four weeks before the previous definition was that how was your mood in the last three months but now you will ask her tell me about your mood how was your mood in the last four weeks write it down four weeks then your second question is are you having as much fun as four weeks ago or are you having as much fun as four one month ago or you can say are you still as happy as you were one month ago or not these two questions you have to ask if she will say yes to anything that no like you are asking so how is life that is also one way of asking how is life how has been your mood in the last one month she will say yeah i'm going on you will, so you should raise concern what happened what has changed why you are not happy then she will say that she will reveal only when you will ask her then she will reveal and then you will have to say that you know anything you will say here it will be totally confidential so you can trust me and tell me that why your mood is like this what do you want to tell me this is very important unless you will reassure her she will never share information with you that is very important then don't leave here you will have to summarize the whole history for her after that you will go to the examination section you will have to do the you will comment on the general physical examination then sometimes you have to do the specific examination but breast examination if you have to do they will bring a male person or maybe they will not ask you to do the breast examination only it must be mentioned in the notes only you are never allowed to do rectal examination or vaginal examination in the dummy yes in the dummy they can always bring a speculum they can bring some other instrument they can ask you that tell us how you will take a sterile urine sample like that so you will have to demonstrate but like i told you you will take verbal consent you will tell the examiner that what you will do you will tell this to the patient and then we will proceed okay don't go without telling anyone because if you don't observe the ethics or you don't take consent from the patient or you examine her without taking her consent everything will go against you then generally after taking the history or and if they have given you the history already in the question you should confirm okay go introduce yourself and you can simply say you don't have to say that i am one of the examiners here and this and that no simply say that i am dr so and so and i am here for the examination straight forward nothing else so that's how you should proceed so confirm the history then you will have a look at the investigations or you will tell that what investigations should be done the management main focus is on the management then always give follow up appointments where it is indicated 
or if you need to refer the patient, tell her that you are referring to her to a, another place and who will be responsible for her care. You should, you should tell her that who is going to care for her. And then you should invite questions. Then you should conclude or close the whole play. So in the end, you should conclude. I will tell you that what you should say. So let's start with the history. History taking is something which you are doing every single day. Okay. So from this moment onward, I want you to take your follow this, this pattern um, for your history taking. I understand that in many hospitals they have their own uh, performer for taking the history. So even when you are taking the points, try to do at least one history every single day so that uh, these behaviors they will be reinforced because real good history is going to get you good marks. When you are taking history in an obstetric patient, you have to confirm patient identity. And patient identity means you will ask her name, name of the husband, occupation, how do you ask for it, about it. You will say, what do you do for a living? So don't say that, when were you born? So how old are you? You can ask directly. Where do you live? Why this question is important? Because, you know, if he is living in some far flung area, then it is hard for her to get medical attention. But if she is living in Riyadh, in some other metropolitan, then you know that she can go, she will go out of her house and within two, three streets, she's going to find the PACC. Why if she is coming from some mountain, some far off area, then it is, you should automatically think that she is not getting full care because it is hard for her to go to the hospital. What do you do for living? You finish school, college, educational background because you should know that who is sitting in front of you and how you should be talking to her. So then, in the, you know, the survey concept form, it also says that you should ask that what is that uh, monthly income? So you, how you can ask her that? So are you happy with your life? You are able to, now the things are very expensive. Are you able to bear expenses? She will say yes, something like that. Then you should ask her, is there any hospital near your place, near your house? She will say yes. So do, do you go there often? She will say yes or no. That is the point. So then you will go and you will, uh, in, even in the history, you are in the opening sentence, you are going, going to write, you must have seen that, how do we write the history? This is 37 year old, grabbed up five, pair of pair three plus one at 32 weeks of gestation, presented to me because of Vaginal bleeding, then write down three days. Abdominal pain started just now. Vomiting since yesterday. So in chronological order, what is what was the first complaint? What was the second complaint? What was the third complaint? Okay, so gravida para, live births, abortion, then P, what is the period of gestation? And uh, then when was her last menstrual period? And when is her an estimated date of delivery? Is she booked? That is she caring, getting cared somewhere because book patient means things are fine. Unbook, it will raise many concerns. Unbook means that she has not received good care. So you should be ready to see more complications, okay? Or maybe this is someone, some foreigner person or maybe some asylum seeker. So you don't know anything about her. Then has she received immunizations? Like uh, immunization, like I would say that HEPA p -Vex is complete. And MMR she has taken for mumps, measles, rubella, or if she has like SLE, she has sickle cell, she has sickle cell disease, or she has thalassemia. Sicklers and the thalassemics, they need prophylactic vaccines. Like uh, what vaccinations they need? They need annual vaccination for influenza. Then uh, they need every five years they need vaccination for pneumococcal, pneumococcal vaccination then they need vaccination for encapsulated bacteria like hemophilus influenzae like for the flu virus then um, many go then also for influenza and many virus okay she will need vaccination for all of these things then as you know the sicklers, they will be on regular insulin, uh, regular ampicillin therapy. They can be benzyl penicillin therapy that are they taking the daily dose or they are not taking. Then sometimes, you know, these um, 
those who are thalassemics, they will be getting chelating agents. So is she taking any medicine? Patients with the autoimmune disorders, they will be they will be taking any drugs. PET patients, GDM patients. So according to their profile, we will ask them that what are they taking for how long they have been taking and how it is affecting their life. So then what are her chief complaints? What are the main complaints? She will tell you that she's a book case. She has been referred from somewhere or she is coming just on her own. And then what are her complaints? She is complaining of pain, bleeding, leaking. Whatever complaint is there, you need to write down their dur duration. You will write down point one, complaint one, two, and three. Then in the history of present illness, you need to elaborate the symptoms that tell me about the pain. There are simple ways. You will ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are those in which your patient will get a chance to tell her story. So for instance, if he has pain abdomen, then you should say, okay, Fatma, tell me about the pain in your tummy. So she will say, yeah, doctor, I have this pain. It started three days ago. It was mild in the beginning. And uh, then it has increased. Now I cannot sit or lie down. And in addition to the pain in the tummy, this pain goes to my back also. It goes to my lower abdomen also. So if somebody has pain, you need to ask them eight to 10 questions. So imagine in the OSCE, if you will ask her all about eight to 10 questions on pain, then it will consume all the time. So how you will complete the session? You cannot. That's why you will ask open ended question. Okay, Fatma, tell me about the pain in your tummy. She will tell you about everything. This pain is there. If I will lie down, it will improve. Or if I will take paracetamol, if at all, then this pain will improve. Everything she is going to tell you. Okay, so just write down. If there is a discharge, similarly, she will open up and she will tell everything. So you have to elaborate the symptoms. And you have to see that how they started, what caused it, was she doing anything, and what is the complication. And pregnant woman, always ask him. So how is the baby moving? Can you feel the movement? Is it just like you the movement before? Then any history of, then go to the past history. Any history of diabetes? Any history of high blood pressure? So when you are taking a past history, you are going to include everything history of the present pregnancy. Tell me about the pregnancy so far. How were things in the first three months? So you should ask her, this pregnancy is planned or unplanned, okay? And um, it occurred spontaneously or you needed some help. Why? Because you know that risk profile will change with the type of pregnancy, okay? So where the pregnancy was confirmed, how it was tested, did you test your urine yourself? She will say yes or no. Now the close-ended question. Close-ended questions are those where uh, your patient will have to say yes or no. There cannot be maybe, maybe not, no. A clear yes or no answer, that is going to be the close-ended question. So you will mention that one. Then have you been following up in the PACC or with someone? Okay, she will tell you. Then is there any history of excessive vomiting? Is there any history of fever? If there is history of fever, ask her that were there any eruptions, was there any rash also, so that you are looking for chickenpox and you are looking for the parvovirus infection. Then any history of any other problem, exposure to radiation, like he will tell you that maybe if he has history of uh, chest infections, then any history of bleeding, any history of UTI, any discharges from down below, any drugs she has taken so far. In the second trimester, ask her that, are you following up regularly? Do you see the doctor regularly or maybe the midwife? So do you go to your PACC regularly? You are getting regular checkups, okay. How much weight she has gained? What investigations have been done? If he knows nothing about her last menstrual period, then ask her that when was the first time when you felt that the baby is moving, okay? Then write that, that down. So, you know, if this is a multi, she will usually appreciate the fetal movement between 16 to 18 weeks. And if it is a multi, then she can, if this is a nulliparous or the first time mother, then she can identify the fetal movements at between 18 to 20 weeks of pregnancy. So, if she is like in the 
and going towards the end of second trimester. So it means we have 26 weeks ask that um, any glucose testing was done because we can do this OGTT from 28 to 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy. Any history of having high blood pressure, any symptom of having uh, uh, change in the blood pressure now, any history of spelling of her teeth, history of bleeding, any drugs she has taken. If she's in the third trimester, ask her that has she been following up regularly? Did she ever have any problem? How much weight she has gained? And uh, is there any history of gestational diabetes mellitus, any history of gestational hypertension? You will ask and any history of high blood pressure, any history of uncontrolled sugar in this pregnancy. Then again, history of uh, you know bleeding per vagina, any pain any discharge per vagina, history of lower abdominal pain, any drugs, labor pains, any history of itching. Okay. After that, you would ask her about the menstrual history. When was the first period, menarche? So when did you have your first period? Tell me about your cycles. Are they regular? She will say yes. Mm -hmm. Are they occurring regularly every 28 days? She will say yes every 28 days, or maybe she will tell you that, oh, sometimes they are coming up two weeks, sometimes after six weeks. Then. How many days if you have time so for how long you will have cycles she will tell you three days four days five days so uh, it is normal uh, how many pads you are using every single day are you passing are you passing any clots okay do you ever get any bleeds during periods when was your last menstrual period was there any abnormality then ask her are you taking anything for contraception because you were using any pills before uh, conception or what were you using for controlling the size of your family she will tell you okay? then marital history for how long you have been married doesn't marriage any history of infertility any other problems with the husband or with you she will tell you then go to the previous obstetric history how many times she has uh, conceived and what were the outcome uh, everybody, everybody was uh, all the babies they were delivered normally vaginally cesarean section what was done any history of bleeding any history of preeclampsia what the ever did she ever have any baby of the small size that is what the IUGR did you develop sugar in any pregnancy that is about the DDM then tell me about the labor every time you had spontaneous labor or the doctor had to start as I had to start it with some medicine okay then once you started just having these labor pains so when did you deliver because it will give you some idea that she's having normal labors prolonged labors or what okay tell me about the delivery was it normal she will say yes sir did they do any episiotomy did they so for this part did they cut you from down below that should be the word sentence okay did they cut you from down below to deliver the baby she will tell me so baby was born normally or the doctor had to help you assisted means that you applied vacuum or the forceps and you should ask about the uh, instrument if they use and was there any complication then if he is having previous cesarean sections then ask that what is the indication why cesarean was done and how was the period immediately after the cesarean section then any history of blood transfusion any history of any bleeding in the previous uh, births and then always ask about the baby. How was the baby? Born alive, doing well, okay. So baby died during birth, God forbid, or what happened? Okay. What was the name of baby? There were any congenital anomaly? There was any problem at the time of birth? Okay, was the baby admitted to the nursery? She will say yes or no, okay. So you started breastfeeding the baby, okay. And how long did you feed the baby? Okay, this many months or that one like that. So how is the baby doing now? The baby is doing very well. Then how was the period after the birth? Did you develop any infection? Like that will be the third sepsis. So if he underwent this cesarean section, then you should ask her when he started moving, when did they remove the catheter? And very important patient safety, always ask her about the blood group. So do you know what is your blood group? She will tell you that she knows or she doesn't know. So if he's negative, ask her that did she receive the injection after birth of the baby? NTD, you should always ask. Even if they show you one discharge summary, usually the blood group will be negative and then you should check that the NTD was given or not. After that, 
that after that what she did after birth of the baby did she use contraception what sort of contraception she used so is there any gap between the children or she's having them every year every two years or whatever is her life plan in cases she had previous cesarean section so in this, in all of these points you will ask her when she had a normal delivery okay but if she had a previous cesarean section you, you should ask her why cesarean was done then you should ask her that it was done as an emergency or it was an elective section so did she have labor pain and then cesarean was done because so you want to know that it was a full cesarean section pre-labor elective or it was done during labor and was there any complication that's why they did the second stage cesarean section did she receive any blood transfusion so sutures were removed or because uh, they didn't uh, have to re remove it. Mostly they will be substituted, so nobody will come back for removal. But if your patient is obese, maybe she will have had these staples. So any history of swelling of the feet, what time they remove the catheter, any leg pain, the leg pain because we are asking about the VTE, very important, because number one cause of maternal death worldwide. So after cesarean, baby stayed with you or baby went to the NICU. So feeding was started or not? If they give you a case of unfortunately this stillbirth, you will ask her that uh, when was this baby delivered? In uh, how many weeks of pregnancy it was? What was the weight of the baby? So patient developed the pains, she or she went into spontaneous labor or not? So what was the, the uh, cause of the death of the baby? Was it prematurity? That was the baby before born before 37 weeks of pregnancy? So did the baby have any anomalies? Uh, was the baby small for the dates? Any history of heart prolapse or heart compression? Any history of preeclampsia? Any history of a GDM? And then you should ask that if he had any abortions, what was the cause after how many weeks he aborted? And uh, any history of any procedure, like maybe she came after incomplete miscarriage. So any history of parotation and keratage, any other procedure? And sometimes, you know, you know that medical termination of pregnancy is not offered, but in certain conditions, like in cases of pulmonary hypertension, and in cases of en encephalic babies, they can offer termination of pregnancy. Also in cases of polio amyloidosis, in cases of Potter's syndrome, the termination of pregnancy can be offered. So if uh, something was done in your patient, then why it was done? And after how many weeks of gestation it was done? In the past history, you should ask about the surgeries, any history of operations, so why they were done, what, what procedure was done. Then also, you know, the history of having any other problems like uh, GDH, like DM, hypertension, epilepsy, any history of, have you ever received blood transfusion? She will say yes or no. And then at the same time, you should ask her that if the need arises, will you accept blood transfusion? Because some patients, they will not accept blood, uh, blood transfusion. So for such patients, you will say that, okay, I will mention in your notes that you, you will not like to have blood transfusion. That is okay. So among the diseases, if the patient doesn't mention anything, you should ask her any history of jaundice, that any history of yelling of the skin, any history of coughing, any history of blood with the cup, and uh, any history of having abdominal pain with discharge, all of these things you need to ask. Then also ask that any history of heart disease, any history of having diabetes, thyroid problem, any diabetes, any thyroid disorder, anything like that. History of drug allergies is very important. Then you will go to the person history. History of any medications, history of any psychiatric disorders, how is her sleep, are you able to sleep well, how is your appetite, how is your weight. So tell me about your water works. You have to ask about the bowel and the bladder function. For the bowel, you should ask her that every day do you pass the stool? Because you know you don't have to feel shy, just ask in a respect a respectable manner. Okay. And how are your water works? When you have to ask about the bladder, how are your water works? Then do you smoke? If she says yes, then ask immediately. Have you ever thought about stopping it? Because you know this smoking is not good for you, you can have many complications. Okay, so do you take drugs? Because many youngsters, they like to take drugs for infection also. So if, I hope you're not the one, but are you taking anything? Are you addicted to anything? You can ask very directly. 
diet. Do you eat well? Are you allergic to any food components? And uh, otherwise, you know, you don't have to ask. Then um, food, any change in the appetite? Like, are you, do you think you are eating more? Or in cases of hyperemesis, do you think that you are able to eat? If she will say yes, then ask her, are you able to keep, uh, keep food down? It means that you are not vomiting that particular. So all of these things. Then you need to ask about the family history. That if you don't mind, I need to ask some questions about your family. They will help me in calculating your risk. Are your parents alive? How are they doing? Do they have any disorder like diabetes, high blood pressure? You can say sugar, sugar in the blood, high blood pressure. Any other, any history of having uh, twins in the family? You will not say multiple pregnancy. Any history of having twins in the family? Okay, she will say yes, no. Is there any history of any uh, problems in the family? Like the baby was not properly formed, baby had some problem? She will say yes or no. Okay, any history of infections like a cough, cough with sputum or cough with blood and something like that? Okay, no. Any history any of any other condition in the family? Basically, you need to ask about the bleeding disorders. Is there someone who will bleed a lot after a small birth? Something like that? She will say no. Then in the end, she will summarize the whole history for your patient. So can I tell you that? So what I have understood or gathered from you is that you are 30 year old female and you are grabbed up and out or abortion this one and you came to and you know you are 22 weeks pregnant and you have come to us with the complaint of let's say abdominal pain for the last few days or you can say that okay your baby was not moving and you have been referred to us by, the, by your primary health care physician and you have come from higher you have come from higher and you also have diabetes hypertension asthma and the heart disease and that's why you have been referred here uh, so we have admitted you for evaluation or workup or, or for the confinement of the patient in, in cases of abuse, in cases of like um, injury, you can say that we have admitted you for confinement or for your further assessment. So that's all about the obstetric history taking. And I would once when we finish it today, today and tomorrow, I want you to go over them. Uh, quickly because you will remember these points because in, in one way or the other you are going to use the same points in the history so any question any issue so far okay so as you have seen half of your patients will be from the ob half will be from the gynae usually what happens is four are taken from the gynae four are taken from the ops and other two stations, they will test your non-technical skills. Like read audit report from some hospital or read protocol of some hospital, read some guideline, read some research article, and then you will have to comment like appraisal of the medical literature. Okay, and the second aspect will be to take gynecological history. So you are doing it on the time. So again, you will introduce yourself. I'm Dr. So-and-so and I'm here for the exam. Uh, can I confirm your a name and age? She will tell her name and her age. So you need to start with the open-ended questions. Like you will say, like you have a patient with pain, so you can say that, can you please tell me about this pain in your tummy? And then you can ask her, you will ask like three, four open-ended questions. Okay, tell me about the pain. Okay, tell me about the bleeding. Okay, tell me about this water that came out of your tummy. She will tell you that it, it was a color, no change, what time it came, what happened, that what, what I did later and stuff like that. Okay. So if she's giving you the history that she has bleeding, she has given you some basic information. After that, you need to ask her specific information. So you will ask now the close-ended questions. Close-ended questions are, she has told you that she had bleeding and she has been caring and receiving treatment. So you will ask her. So you are still bleeding heavily. She will say yes or no, because it's, uh, its answer cannot be like, as, like a plus minus. 
So she will have to say yes or no, or she will say that yes, it is occurring, but it is not that bad now. I mean, it is less than before, but still I'm having this problem. Or she will say that, no, 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 this bleeding has stopped. So you can understand that she will have to give one confirmatory answer. And you also have to summarize the history again, okay? So again, in the identification, what is your name? How will you like me to call you? So uh, tell me about your age, please. So uh, tell me that uh, are you getting these periods regularly? Or even tell you that, uh, no, my period stop. Okay, if they stop, when did they stop? So what uh, para and how many life births? Um, she has come from which room you have come. So did you attend university? Or you can say that, did you go to the college? She will tell you something that she's a professional. But usually, you know, this, uh, these things, they will not write in the history in the introduction. They will not write that she's a nurse or she's a doctor. They will just write down that you are about to see a 27 year old patient who has been having heavy vaginal bleeding and she has noticed that the size of her tummy is also increasing. So you should know one thing, that if they're writing something, if she really has this problem, so you are going to trust them. So how many children you have before, all of them are alive, you never had any miscarriage, no baby died like that. So from where you have come, so did you attend college? Did you attend university? So how do you earn your living? So do you work? You can ask that one also, okay? So how much money do you, how much do you make every month? So it will give you some idea about her socioeconomic status because you know that is also important. Post maturity is more common in the high socioeconomic group and uh, pre-maturity is more common in the uh, poor, uh, relatively poor people or the lower socioeconomic strata. Then are you married? Okay, if sometimes you know in the gynae you can get the older patients, so are you widowed, do you live alone, who lives with you? Like all of these things you should ask. Then what are her main complaints? Like she's telling you that she has begun a discharge. So for how many days you have this discharge? Okay. What else you have? She will tell you that she has itching, so you will write down write us again. The question is for how many days you have this problem? Okay, she has bleeding for how many days? Any swelling in the tummy? She can tell you that she has pain in the abdomen. Everything she will tell you, you will have to write down. And you have come yourself, or you have been referred by someone, or someone has sent you. She will tell you that she has been referred from somewhere. Okay, so what did the doctor tell you? You can even ask here because this case can be in the OPD. If this is an emergency, then of course you're not going to ask all of these things. Then you're just going to confirm the identity and the data. So the who have sent you here? Okay. So tell me a bit more about your condition. Here you need to ask her. This is that when you say that tell me a bit more about your condition. So you are asking her about the past history. Okay. So then you can say that uh, what happened? How it happened after how many times many times you develop this problem after how many months this condition deteriorated like that so here you will have to say that patient was apparently normal how many months back three months back when she noticed that she is having regular discharges she is having pain in the abdomen so you are going to explain each symptom she has discharge this discharge is yellowish in color it is associated with itching and before even having this discharge, she had abdominal pain. So actually she had abdominal pain. It was followed by a discharge and the discharge was followed by itching like that. The chronological order that in which order all of these things occur. So then ask her that what else happens because you are trying to identify the etiology, the cause and the risk factor and the complications. What else she has? Did she develop fever? So any history of infection like that. So when you are further elaborating the points and according to the history, you will have to change. Then you will go to the past history. Let's talk about the symptoms, like if she has a discharge. So here you are going to see like there are uh, 14, 15 modules. So you are going to get like at least 10 different types of histories, okay? But this is a general template. Like if somebody has come to you with a vaginal discharge, okay? So what you should ask her. So when did this start? For how long you were having it? That it started suddenly or it was gradual, like it was taken the start and then it changed its character. 
amount quantity is applied very little or it is moderate or it is too much excessive discharge and she has to change her dresses frequently or she has to wear a pair so tell me about a bit more about the discharge what is the consistency is it thick is it thin is it frothy or it is watery it, or there is purse so you can ask about the color is it white, green, gray, yellowish? So don't give her a lead that is it white, is it green? Tell, ask her, what is the color of the discharge? Is there any smell? She will tell you. Then this discharge, this is continuous or it is coming and going. Coming and then you're better or it is sometimes coming, sometimes not coming. Then uh, have you ever noticed any blood in the discharge? Okay, so when are you having this discharge? When you have this menstruation just before that or after finishing the menstruation or one week after the menstruation or in the middle of the cycle. So it will give you some clue because if there is too much discharge before having this period, then it means that maybe she has a polyp or maybe she has cervical ectropia and both will present in the same way. Patient will have more discharges before periods. Is she having a Periods, then maybe she's getting some infection or that is only physiological discharge. If she is having too much watery discharge in the middle of the cycle, then maybe this is because of the more estrogen into the system and this is not pathological. Okay? Then if she has discharge, does she have itching? Um, does she have like a feeling of uh, something is bothering her? And then is it associated with any pain or anything like that or not? Then if the patient is coming to you with vaginal bleeding, then what sort of questions you should ask her? That tell me a, more, um, a bit more about this bleeding. So are you having this bleeding? Like she will tell you periods. So are you having regular monthly bleeds? She will say yes or no. Then you should ask her that do you have this cycle more than once in a month? That will be polymenorrhea, okay? Then ask her that do you get periods every month? If she will say no. One month I will get, and then for two, three months I will not get. So that will be oligomenorrhea. Then you need to ask her that are you having multi, having this bleed multiple times or what? If she says that heavy bleeding, then you need to ask her that uh, is bleeding on this in the start of the cycle, or for how long you are having it, and uh, how much heavy it is, how many pairs you are using every single day. Are you passing the blood drops is it associated with the pain for how, for how many days on average you will bleed so then you need to ask her that what is the interval between the two bleeds okay and this bleeding is continuous it is intermittent then at the same time you need to ask her that uh, do you ever get bleeding how this bleeding started it will start after having the intercourse or it will occur without any intercourse and do you get bleeding in between the periods also or you don't get it okay then you need to ask about his key history of sexually transmitted infections like uh, did you ever get this sort of uh, infection before a condition before where you had the discharge or your husband did develop this problem where he had too much discharge like that something like that or you had discharge and itching like that bleeding you have to ask about the STIs also because in chlamydial infection she can have this post white bleeds. In human papilloma virus infections, after that she can have bleeds again. Any history of uh, infection? Why we are asking about TB because TB is again again becoming very common. So you need to ask her any history of respiratory infections because um, you need to ask that there is no other sort of infection in this patient. So are you using? Any pills, combination pills for controlling the size of our family planning. That should be the thing, okay? Because uh, some COCDs, what they do, the mixed time, they can cause it copian. So there is, because the patient can have, the body will get this message that she is pregnant like that. So there will be growth of epithelium on the transformation zone. So on touch or even without sex, she can have this bleed. Then are you wearing any intrauterine device for controlling for family planning? She will say yes or no. Then, you know, in the start, in the first three months, she can have like spotting. And especially, uh, you know, if she has this gliconaldestrin or mirena, then again, she can have slight bleed. 
if you want to ask about the history of Amma's Parikram, then you should ask her that when was the first time she noticed that there is something in, inside her tummy. So this did this swelling become visible suddenly or it was like small in the start and then gradually increase over a period of time. When was the first time she noticed? So where did she see feel, uh, this swelling for the first time? Then what was the size? So in how many months it has grown in the size? Is it associated with any pain? So does she feel any heaviness in the tummy? Like this uh, pressure symptoms usually they are more common if she has an ovarian cyst. Then tell me about your food, your eating habit. Is there any change? Do you think that you cannot digest the food? Do you have this uh, distension in the abdomen? Do you think that your abdomen swells up after taking the food? Or has your abdomen become distended or bloated uh, ever since this mask came? And do you have this uh, feeling that you don't want to eat anymore? Have you lost any weight in the last three months? Do you feel any feeling of pain in the abdomen? Do you have any some discomfort in the abdomen? Then do you feel breathless? Any history of nausea? Do you feel like throwing up? That's what you are going to ask her. If she's, uh, you want to ask about vomiting, are you always throwing up because she has this abdominal mass or she has this um, swelling? Which so that's why you are asking. So does your feet swell? Because you are asking about the edema. So if you have to ask about the pain, again the same question. Tell me a bit more about your pain, how it started. Uh, did it come suddenly or it was gradual in answer? Where exactly you have the pain? So this pain is felt only here or it goes to other parts of the tummy also. So tell me about the, you know, for how long you will, you are having it. So tell me about the pain. It is continuous or it will come and then you will feel better and then it will come again. Or tell me that when do you feel the pain more? Then do you think that pain occurs near your cycle? She will say yes or no. Do you think that pain will occur at any time? It has no relationship with your cycle. She, she will again say yes, no, or anything. Then do you feel the pain only in this side? Let's say that she's having pain on the right side of her tummy. So this pain is only on the right side of your tummy or you can feel pain in some other areas also. Don't tell her that do you feel pain on the left side of the tummy? She will, of course, you will say yes. So do you feel pain only on the right side of your tummy or you feel in some other area? So she will tell you that what she feels. So then you should ask her, have you ever noticed that what will you do? And then this pain will decrease. So you are asking about the aggravating factors. Then you should say that have you ever noticed that you will do something and then the pain will increase? So you are asking about the aggravating factors. So tell me when you have these pains, do you vomit with it? Have you ever developed fever with this pain? Like that. So all of these things you should be asking. So if you are asking um, a patient who is like older or even the younger patient that can present with prolapse, so how you should ask her? That have you, uh, so tell me what do you feel? She will say that I feel a lump hanging from down below. Down below, down below means that you are, she's having some mass in the vagina, something like that. But she has been guided constantly to say that she thinks that some lump is coming from down below. That will be the word. So when did you notice first? So it, it has gradually increased in size or it was big right from the start. So, it, uh, so do you think that when you are straining, when you are trying hard to pass the urine quickly, or you are trying hard to pass the stool. Do you think that it increases in size? So you are saying that what is the effect of straining on that? So what happens to this mass if you will cough or you will pass stool or you are like exerting to pass urine or when you are exercising or does the size increase when you are lifting any weight like you are putting, uh, pulling up, uh, carrying the groceries which you have bought from the supermarket? Do you think that after that the pain increases or what? So when you lie down, does this mass decrease in size? This is about the prolapse. So she will say yes or no. So have you ever tried to push this mass back with your fingers? She will say yes or no. So what happens when you do? 
he will tell you that this mass will decrease or it will not decrease. So you can say that this mass is reducible or not reducible. So what exactly do you feel? Is it hard for you to walk with this thing hanging, dangling down between the legs? Or how, so if it is affecting you, then how do you continue your daily work? Because maybe she's a professional, she's a teacher, she's a doctor, she's working somewhere else. Then it must be very bad for her. So how she's dealing with that, with it. So when you will ask her that, can you please tell me that how it has changed your life? So how it is affecting your life? So sometimes they will start crying. Sometimes they will simply volunteer. They will share something with you. So write down everything. Then if there is history of uh, prolapse, which is the mass which is felt on the vagina. So do you feel fullness or heaviness in the vagina? She would say yes or no. So it is coming out of the vagina for how long you have been having this problem? Again, the same questions. So can it, this be pushed back upwards or it cannot be pushed? She will tell you. Can you push it back? She will say no. So it means that whenever you, even when you will try to push this mask back into the interface, it will not go back. You will say yes. So you are using a combination of open-ended questions and the closed-ended questions. Then you will ask her that, uh, okay, when this thing comes out, this mask comes out, she will say that I have a bulge down below. So do you feel pain in your back? because it is usually associated with back pain because of the pull on the nerves. Then uh, you should ask her, that tell me about your water works. Are you able to pass the urine, pass urine as you were doing before? Or then tell me that do you have to pass urine more often than you, do, than, than you were doing before? Then you can say that, do you think it's hard for you to start passing the urine? Because maybe there is some compression, so she cannot pass the urine. Uh, properly, then you need to ask her that once you pass the urine, do you, are you satisfied that your bladder is empty or you need to uh, put exert some force to pass urine? So she will tell you about that. Okay. And sometimes you can you need to ask her that do you have to push this mask up if you want to pass urine? She will say yes, I have to push it up or I have to hold it with my fingers and only then I can pass urine. So then you should see as tell her that you think that uh, because that you can uh, empty your bladder fully or you cannot. That is that you can pass out whole blood or you cannot. Then ask her any history of infection in the urine. She will say yes or no. Then you should ask her that have you ever noticed that if you will cough, you will laugh or you will sneeze. And then at the same time, you will wet yourself. You will, because we cannot ask the patient that. Do you have stress incontinence? She is not a medical person, right? So you will not use the medical yardin. Just ask her that when you laugh, you uh, you know carry some weight, or you sneeze. So do you wet yourself? It means that you are leaking urine, or you are not. So do you feel any pressure, like feeling in your tummy? You will say yes or no. Then you should ask her that uh, are you able to pass the power, pass the stool or you are not. You can also say if the educational level of patient is right here, then you can say that can you move your bowels every day or you cannot. Then what is the effect of do you have this continuous cup? Chronic cup means that she has cup for more than two weeks. And then any history of having any lung disease, trust me that even if your patient has history of asthma, she can develop urinary incontinence because she will be sneezing and coughing so hard that she, the urine will also leak. Any history of tumor in the abdomen before? Then you should ask her that does she have any discharge? Does she have any bleeding? Then you should ask her that since you have this mass here, so how it has affected your life? Are you able to have sex? or you cannot have sex, then you need to ask her that, do you think that you pass, you leave wet yourself during sex? Are you afraid to have this sex because you are afraid that you will wet yourself or it, you will have pain or you are feeling embarrassed? You know, all of these things, they have effect on the quality of life. So you need to ask during exam also. Regarding bowel or uh, bladder habit um, history, you should ask that, are you able to pass urine properly? Do you feel any pain or pa on passing urine? Any history of having any problem in the kidney? Do you have any mass in the abdomen? Any, any, did the doctor ever tell you that you have some 
a harmless mass in the tummy like that? She will say yes or no. Then do you think that you have to pass the urine more frequently? Do you think that you cannot pass the urine happily and then you have to pass, go to the bathroom again and again because you cannot empty your bladder fully? And then do you have difficulty in passing the urine? And then if, if uh, another condition can be, then that your patient is having some cancers, okay? So she, you are suspecting that she is having some cancers, then what you will do? You should again ask her, any history of increase, uh, you know, this, you have to pass the urine many times a day or like before? Do you feel any pain on passing urine? Do you have any blood in the urine? Then for the incontinence, you will ask her that are you able to pass urine like that, okay? And um, then you, you will ask her any, any history of diarrhea, any history of um, any surgery was done in the uh, cancers. Are you able to hold your urine? Any history of you know, forming any problems, any uh, sex, any cyst like that, good thing. And um, then uh, you, you need to see that any bleeding per rectum, any other abnormality. Like for the menstrual history, you need to ask what was the age when you have your first period. And then if she's postmenopausal, then it is common sense that you will ask her about the last periods. When were her last periods? So when you were having cycles, were they regular? Irregular. After how many days you was getting the periods? Then for how many days the period used to last? Then about how much blood you think you were, how many, how, how many periods you were using every single day? Because if he's using one pair, maybe it has like 10 ml, 15 ml, whatever is the content. Is it associated with passing blood clots? Any history of, um, you know, bleeding during the periods or any history in the poor, any history of passing blood after the menopause? Any other bleeds? When was the last menstruation? Then if she is on regular, then ask her that do you go to the clinic for cervical smears because now more and more trend is increasing because more cases of uh, cervical cancer coming to the scene. So have you been going for the scan for the smears? She will say yes. Regularly, yes. So what was the result of the last smear? Okay, she will tell you that it was fine. Then ask her that anytime the results were not normal, she will mention, she will say yes or no or like. So after that, for how long you have been married? How many children you have? What do you use for the family planning? You will not say that what you will use for contraception. What do you do for family planning? This is understood and they will get this information. So yeah, they will tell you. Obstetric history, any history of infertility? Do you, do you have children? Do you have no children? Any history of miscarriage? You can say that any history of losing babies before five months of pregnancy any history of having pregnancy outside the womb. So what was the age when you had the first baby? And then, then how were the babies? Were the babies vaccinated? Were you able to breastfeed them? Then in the obstetric history, and uh, especially in cases of prolapse, uh, tell me about your labels. Were they normal? So do you remember what was the approximate size of your baby? So do you remember that you delivered by vaginal route or you had cesarean delivery if cesarean was done was it done during labor or it was done before the labor started any history of losing baby before five months so tell me about your labor everything was normal any history of having to push for longer than usual like you were pushing the baby for long time but baby was not coming then what is that how many years gap between the ages of your children and then was any uh, procedure ever done on you? Like uh, you had all normal spontaneous deliveries or the doctor had to pull the baby out with the help of instruments like that. Then ask about the past history. Any surgery was done. And like there was prolapse, there was rectum, fibroid, they did surgery. And then is there any history of hysterectomy, any history of removing the tubes, any history of tying the tubes, closing the tubes? past history of TB or other infections like the pelvic inflammatory disease, history of chlamydia, history of gonorrhea, any other medical disorder like the cardiac disease, diabetes, endocrine disorders, thyroid disorders, any history of colon or endometrial cancer, ovarian, or the breast cancer. Okay. Then the personal history. 
are you allergic to any medicine? So what happens when you take it? You will have rash or he will tell you that she will have only rash or she had to be rushed to the hospital. So when she says that, no, I had to go to the hospital, then you will say, okay, so you develop reaction to that drug. So does your doctor know about it? Okay, I will write it down in red color here or I will enter in your record so that nobody will give it to you even by mistake. Then tell me, are you taking any medicines? Why you are taking them? Who gave this medicine to you? For how long you are taking? Are you able to tolerate the side effects? Or everything you should ask. Tell me about your sleep. Are you able to sleep well? Do you feel fresh in the morning? Tell me about your appetite. Are you able to eat or you don't feel like eating? Then tell me, have you lost any weight recently? She will say yes, no, no. Then um, you can say that I need to ask some personal questions. They are important for your management, but uh, don't mind them, you know. Um, these things are very common nowadays. Do you drink alcohol? Do you smoke? Do you Have you ever taken any other drugs? And if you say, yes, I take alcohol, I like this one. Very hard that anybody will say, but if they tell you that, no, I smoke shisha, and that I like this shisha, or I smoke on cigarettes, then you need to offer her that you have a, have you ever thought about quitting? She will say yes or no. So the, if she says that, yes, I want to quit, then you, you will say, very good plan. I will refer you to the services. Uh, they will help you and then, and then you can stop this habit. And then ask about the diet of the patient. What sort of diet you take? Do you take fruits and vegetables or if you does a don't? Do you eat a lot of uh, you know fast food stuff? Are you buying from outside? So you should mention. And then uh, in that that will be in the general physical examination that we will notice the BMI of the patient okay, in the general physical examination. Then other things, any history of infections, any history of pain on having sex, then the family history. Again, the usual questions like any family history, person history of cancer of colon, endometrium, OV, breast. You should remember that breast is also in the ob uh, domain. Uh, you, till that out, uh, point of diagnosis, this is your domain. Once the patient is going for surgery, that will be the job of the surgeon. But before that, all investigation, suspicion, risk factors, assessment, that is job of the gynecologist. Again, you have to summarize the history. When you are summarizing the history, it is giving you additional marks. First of all, you are not missing any important information. Then the second thing is, you are reminding the examiner that you can conclude everything, okay? So you will say, so now I have this is so and so who is 25 years old, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, or just who is regularly menstruating, or she has an sterilization. In case she has, she is para so and so, how many are living, and she has come with a current complaint of this problem. Does she have any comorbidities like high blood pressure, diabetes, or with other symptoms like this for how, how many days? Since that time, and now she is here because she has developed this problem. She has come herself, or somebody has referred her. You can tell this point here also. So then you can also say that, like if she's very embarrassed, then you can say that this patient has risk factors for developing endometrial cancer and also for developing ovarian and the breast cancer, okay, like right? in the form of infertility. Then if you will not say that they will ask you once you will determine the history she has like this let's say from a normal irregular vaginal bleeding they will ask you that what is your impression don't say that i think she is having this fibroid process always give a list even three words are there that is helpful if she's having abnormal uterine bleeding there can be cause can be in the mouth of the cervix can be in the cervix Cause can be in the uterus or cause can be in the system. There can be local problem, there can be problem in the womb like that. Or maybe there can be hormonal problem, but we need to do further assessment before uh, reaching any diagnosis. And then at the, this point, you should ask the patient, is that all or you would like to add some? Okay, so that's how you're going to continue. Any question, any other issue? Any other problem you have?
Okay. So then many times the students, they like to ask, they find it very difficult. They like to ask you questions that how we should start an OSCE station, especially if they are under too much stress that we have only 10 minutes. So how we will answer the questions? First of all, before your exam, they will send you your ID and they will also tell you that on which station you are going to start your OSCE because like there are many members in the same group. So uh, they cannot continue like this, that number one will go to the number one station and then once you go to number two, then the second doctor will come. So everyone has to start the OSCE at the same time. Only the number of the stations will be the same, but everyone will be standing on a different station. First of all, be sure that you are standing at the right station. Even if you will make a mistake, you will go to some other station. No one is going to correct you. You will lose your time and then you will panic and you will not be able to do as well as you want. They give you two minutes to read the station, then they will ring the bell. And you know, the people who are on the duty, they are very good. They have received training. So they are going to ring the bell uh, after two minutes. They are watching and they have been trained for it. So they read the scenario very carefully and then see that what exactly is the task, what they are asking you and note down important information. What will be the important information? What is the name of the patient? Age, peaks of gestation, comorbidities, any abnormal test results, ultrasound findings, what has been done so far? And the location of the patient is very important. They will tell you that this patient is in the OPD, this patient is in the ER, this patient has is on the board. So location is also very, very important. It's going to give you a good idea about the patient. So you can check clinical information with the patient, but if you forgot the task and been tested, then you know it will be disastrous. So just see what exactly they are asking you. So you know you, you have to maintain a balance. Like you cannot take a detailed history and if the history is already given there and they're asking you to do something else, the task is different. Then if you start taking the history and, you, and the time passes, then they will not give you extra time or they will not even give you the credit because history they had already given. So it will have just uh, very few points because the history they gave you. You are just going to confirm okay you are so and so and you are here because you have problem x y z so let's move forward that how what we can do okay so read the question very carefully if you are standing outside and you couldn't treat the task very properly then even in front of the patient it would be there so you can say that okay i need to go over it please give me just one second like that but you should remember that this time will be taken out from your 10 minutes so after reading that you will make a mental plan and then you can write down the paper also that what you will do or you better if you will make a mental plan also. Just enter the cubicle and the buzzer goes off and uh, you will go to your clinic and you will go confidently, you will talk slowly. You should make, make eye contact, uh, contact with the patient. You should say that I'm Dr. So and so and I'm covering the clinic today or you can just say that I'm in the clinic today. So you are Mrs. A and you have just turned 40. She will say, yes, that's me. Then you will say, I understand that you are here today because of the like he has bleeding or something. She will say, yes or no. So you are confirming the purpose of the consultation. So you can also say that, how can I help you today? She will tell you that what exactly she is having. So give patient an opportunity to tell her story you should lean forward, bend forward, listen to her carefully, and you will not interrupt her. You know, once the patient starts talking, keep silent. Don't talk too much, okay? Listen to her. If you will cut her or him, it will go against you. That like this doctor didn't give the patient a chance to tell her story, which can have bad effect, okay? bad impression. So then when she's telling, she'll say, oh, doctor, this happened to me. Then you should encourage her. You can say, okay, yes, oh, I see. All right, that's perfect. That's perfect. Please go on. Yeah, tell me more about her. So you are just showing that you are listening to her and show appropriate facial expressions. If you are not covering your face, you should maintain eye contact with the patient. 
and show to the patient that you are interested to listen to her story and don't look towards the examiner. Sometimes, you know, there can be a lay examiner, like two examiners are sitting there, especially if it is a, a, a bit technical task or a bit complicated, then you will get two examiners. And both of them are going to assess you separately. So the focus of your attention should be your patient. This is patient-centered exam. So when patient finishes her statement, you should acknowledge her emotions and you should say, I'm sorry that you have been feeling this way. Or you can say, I'm sorry that you had a hard time getting through this. Or if she has lost a baby, you can say, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. These are reassuring words, okay? If the patient is, her, is happy about her condition, you should also say something like that, like uh, congratulations, and you should show. You don't, don't only say congratulations. You say, oh, that's great, congratulations, because she has conceived after a long period of infertility, because that will be the proper thing to say. Then whatever she has told you, you'll say, summarize that. Okay, so you have this problem, that's why you here. You are here. She will say yes. And before moving on, you should ask her, is there anything else that you like you are hoping to, hoping to discuss today? Like I've told you that sometimes a patient will have another complaint and she wants to ask you about something more serious, but she will she doesn't have courage or she is scared. So she will ask you another thing. So but you will get some non-verbal cues that she is not happy, she's twisting her fingers, she is putting right, left, she's tapping her feet. Then you will ask her, okay, tell me what else do you want to tell me? Okay? And then reassure her. So that is sometimes she can have like a hidden agenda, like domestic violence, or maybe she is afraid of getting some cancer. Then patient will present with vague complaints that sometimes I have pain in the tummy, sometimes I have nothing. So this is called that you are going to set an agenda as an important part for initiating the station. There is something called signposting. What is signposting? That you are telling her that I need to ask you some questions related to your condition. This is signposting. So now I'm going to ask about your past history. So you are telling her that you are going to ask her about the past history. So you will gather the information. So yeah, you should gather information from the patient to explore her issues as well as to register her perspective that what is she feeling. And then you have listened to her complaints, then you will say that can you please tell me a bit more about this condition, pain, bleeding, anything you have. Now ask her more close questions. Do you feel any pain during your period also? She will say yes or no. Do you get pain after your once you have finished your periods also? She will say yes or no. So then you will choose the first open-ended questions, then closed questions, narrow-ended questions or closed questions. So ask about all of her symptoms to determine if they are just part of a current problem or she is having something which is chronic. So to listen to the patient's perspective, this is very important. Patient's perspective means that what is the patient trying to tell you? So this is called ICE model. So ICE model, this is very helpful in answering the OSCE questions. ICE means, first of all, ideas. You will ask the patient that do you have some idea that why you are having this problem? Or do you have some idea that what is causing these complaints? So because patient will be having some idea about her condition, especially in chronic pelvic pain. Then in cases of endometriosis, in cases of PIDs, then you should explore her concerns. So you should say, is there anything in particular that has been worrying you about your condition? So she will tell you if she has some hidden agenda. Then ask her about what are her expectations. So you will say, what were you hoping us to do for you today? So she will tell you. So the feelings and effects. So you should ask her, how have you been feeling about your condition? Then you can also see something like this, that how has it affected your life? Okay, so this is the ICE model that you will do. Very important for you to assess that what is the effect on her quality of life. Now these things are more important than the actual disease, that how it is affecting your life. So how it, it has changed the way you were working like that. So you will have to make a few sentences. 
so sometimes you know uh, you will think that it is not possible to take history in less time but if you know that what you need to ask you can take history very good history can be taken in three to four minutes okay then um, if you want to ask about the past then you should uh, say that do you see do you see your gp for any reason or you can say are you generally fit and well she will say she is generally fit and well so it means she is fine you can also say that do you see your gp for any problem so both are okay so again ask about history of any operations before obstetric history gravida para abortions giving termination of pregnancy everything Gynecological histories, like uh, any problem in the gyne, any bleeding, any discharge, anything. What are you choosing for family planning? Are you taking any medicines? Are you allergic to any medicine? Any important patient safety issues? So you should ask them. Any family history of any disorders, especially diabetes, heart disease, cancers, tuber, anything. Then you need to ask her that do you feel good at home? Then you know if you are suspecting abuse like patient is not talking to you she's not engaging in engaging in conversation then you need to ask her do you feel safe at home these are specific questions okay then you can also ask do you have sport at home do you smoke then if she says yes i smoke then you should ask is this a regular smoking or what if you say yes i take i smoke every day what's wrong with that you should say ask her that it is important for manage for your management and you want to see what is the effect on the bb so how many cigarettes do you take every single day he will tell you then you will ask her that have you ever thought about stopping it like that if you will say yes i want i have thought about stopping it then you need to ask her okay i will give you reference of someone you know that smoking cessation programs are there then do you take any drugs do you take do you exercise do you take any healthy diet anything like that so then you know you need to establish a good relationship with the role player or the standardized patient so in the exam you know you have to talk slowly clearly you have to stay calm don't panic your tone should be friendly but firm okay and if the patient is depressed by and like she is mentioning the history of iufd then you should say that i am very sorry to hear about your loss if he is a newly diagnosed case of a cancer, then you should say, uh, so it means that this is a new thing. Okay, he will say yes. So it must have affected you. So tell me what is the effect on your health. So don't be excited, or show concern. And I think it is affecting your health badly. He will say yes or no. So you know the role players, they will get some direction that how they have to say that what problem they are having okay? listen to them very carefully then you should also say if she's having something bad then you should say that it must be very difficult for you to go on while you are having you have been feeling this way again summarize everything signpost and alerting and then you have to focus on empathy throughout the entire station and then explain to the patient about the full range of management options see we, what we can do today is this 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 do you like it then how much time that your treatment will take what is your diagnosis always say that still we have not confirmed diagnosis so let's see we need to run some tests on you then we can say that what should be done for you so then sometimes you should ask the patient also what is your idea about your condition because you are listening to the patient's perspective okay? so then after reaching your diagnosis, you should say that I have listened to everything in detail and my impression is you are having this, this and this. So do you know about this condition? She will say yes or no. Then ask her that have you understood everything in a good way? She will say yes or no. After us telling her about two, three things, you should say, are you with me so far? She will say yes or no. You will say, okay, good, let's move forward. So tell the patient about all management options, including the option of no treatment at all then if you have copy pencil with you you cannot take it privately but usually in the exam they will give you make a small plan say that this is these management options are available for you see make like one two three four make a tree like that okay? and then tell her okay we can do this this is the benefit this is the problem or we can do another intervention this is the benefit and this is the harm of doing it 
and tell her about the benefits that why you are trying to do something and what benefit should be expected and then tell her that this procedure is not carried out then i am afraid that you can have this problem then she will ask you is there no other solution you should tell about the alternative treatments like if she is having postmenopausal symptoms then tell her about the contemporary alternative therapies but tell her clearly that is there any evidence of beneficial benefit or no evidence of benefit so you will have to tell about the alternative treatments pre and the post inter in intervention information and then you know in cases of female genital mutilation in cases of sexual abuse in cases of domestic violence you will have to alert the safeguarding teams from uh, for the protection of the children of that okay. safeguarding you should never forget in certain cases you have to do that so you have carried out the full assessment then how do you close consultation session you will say so miss you so and so who oh, are diabetic and you are seeking information about starting your family this is just one example she will say yes and then you will summarize the most important points in the history include her wishes in the management plan and agree on the next step and then how you are going to achieve it and who is going to be her doctor throughout her care so you will have to ensure patient safety like uh, don't leave any patient in the middle if you are referring her you have to make arrangement for her transfer of the service also then you should always tell patient that if she develops something then the pscc is closed or the er is not accepting anyone then you should come back and then you should talk to her that give me this problem okay so that is the point then you should close by checking if she is happy with the chosen plan and then tell her thank you very much for coming to the clinic today and talking to me is there anything else which i can do do for you like that that is the point okay? so that's all you need to tell her okay let's so